Okay, um, good good morning, everybody. Um, and you're very welcome to um, this SHIPS uh, Dialogue Workshop. Um, SHIPS is smart and healthy aging through people engaging in supportive uh, systems. And uh, today we're being hosted by the Assisting Living and Learning Institute at Maynooth University, which is the university uh, which has the pleasure of leading the overall uh, SHIPS consortium. Um, my name is uh, Mac uh, McLaughlin, and I'm uh, one of the coordination team uh, of this uh, project. Um, so I am a 61-year-old uh, white uh, male with a strange accent, which is a sort of mixture between uh, Scottish and um, Irish. I'm wearing a white shirt and a purple jersey, which I've specially bought for today um, to try and look uh, respectable. And I'm also um, sporting a fading suntan from my uh, holiday in Greece uh, a few weeks ago. Um, so that is how I uh, appear to be. Um, and I'm delighted to say that we are using uh, international uh, sign language uh, today. We're also using real-time uh, captioning in English. We have Spanish and Italian uh, translation, which you can access through the, uh, the, the button at the bottom of the screen. Um, and uh, later for uh, Helmut Luchman's uh, session, we will have uh, German and English uh, translation. Uh, now, we're also very fortunate to have uh, people who are deaf um, as part of this uh, workshop and people who are uh, deaf blind. Um, so we want to encourage people, uh, not just for our uh, deaf blind and deaf colleagues, but for all of us to try and speak slowly um, and to take uh, pauses between our sentences. Um, if you're going to use images in your presentation, please describe those images so other people can uh, understand them. Um, and to introduce yourself uh, each time you join the conversation within the workshop um, and you. So um, we Talking of introducing yourself, we also have a, a chat function and that we very much want you to engage with that uh, chat function and to share your um, ideas. And uh, as part of that approach to communication, we will also be using uh, Slido. Um, if you're not familiar with Slido, it's a, a means of instantly um, getting uh, feedback from the audience and participants. Um, and allowing them to share their ideas uh, anonymously. So um, my colleague, uh, Stacey Campbell, who's the overall manager of the SHAPES project, um, will be facilitating Slido and will explain a bit more about it. Um, when we come to, to, to the uh, interaction uh, elements of this, this morning, um, but the key thing is it's anonymous um, and, and you can say uh, whatever you like, uh, really. So uh, we look forward to that. We also have uh, Tom and Ilya from Manuth, um, who are also going to be uh, taking notes. And uh, uh, that will help us produce a report from this. And this overall uh, workshop is being uh, recorded. So you should be uh, aware that um, anything that, that you say or contribute uh, will, will also be recorded and other people can potentially see that um, in the future. We hope that will actually encourage you to contribute so that your voice uh, is heard. So if we can go on to the next um, slide, please. Um, so we have an interesting slide here on the uh, left-hand side. Um, we uh, restate the, the, the title, The Future of Smart and Healthy Aging, Shapes, uh, Results, Recommendations and Reflections for an Inclusive Europe and a Participative Civil Society. 
So for us, this is a, a really a exciting part of our project. It's coming to the end. We have results, recommendations, uh, and reflection. And our uh, motivation was always to make a, a contribution to Europe being more inclusive and to embrace um, civil society participation in that. Um, we have an image of uh, three very athletic looking uh, soccer players who are all doing their own different type of thing. And then we have uh, an image just in front of them of three older people who are all actually doing a thing together. Um, so it's a, it's a lovely image of uh, older people uh, moving towards us and embracing uh, each other. So it's it's a nice contrast, if you like, between younger people doing their own thing and the older people all doing the thing to, together. Um, and I think that is a, a nice sort of metaphor. Um, here we're looking across the 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 life course, um, but we're particularly interested in how we, uh, as a project, uh, using technologies but other means as well, can help older people uh, stay in their communities and to live. Uh, longer and healthier lives uh, together uh, within their community. If you can go to the next slide, please. So uh, we have a, a terrific um, lineup um, for you today. I'll shortly be going over to my uh, Maynooth uh, colleagues, uh, Katja and Jamie, and they're going to talk about um, our starting point within um, this project. So although the project has a lot to do with technology, we didn't start with technology, we started with what did people want. Um, and then we'll hear one of the uh, shape stories. Uh, we're very glad to have uh, Helmut Lutzman, um, who participated uh, in one of our pilot uh, projects in, in Germany. That will be followed, um, staying in, in Germany, uh, by uh, Sonia, who really oversaw the largest um, work package within um, the overall SHAPES project. And she'll be telling us uh, some of the findings from um, our, our pilot uh, demonstration sites. Um, then we'll be coming back to um, Maynooth with uh, my colleague, uh, Michael, uh, who's also the code lead uh, with myself of the, the SHAPES project. And then we'll be uh, nipping over to uh, Portugal, where Barbara will tell us um, about the ship's marketplace. And really what the marketplace uh, means is how we present the different technologies and how to use them in combination to the general public, to service users and to service providers. Um, and then just before the break, we'll be heading off to um, the beautiful island of Crete, where Ionis uh, from the um, Hellenic Mediterranean University uh, will give us a, a demonstration. Um, we'll have a, a short break. And then after that, we have um, uh, a, a number of really interesting uh, perspectives um, from uh, Kathy Holloway, who's a professor of computer science um, from University College London and is with the Global Disability Innovation Hub, who are leading um, on, on a global basis a, a lot of the innovation work uh, around disability and technology. We have uh, Lucia de Arano, who is with the World Federation of the Deaf Blind and has made a, uh, a great contribution to, to the SHAPES project as has uh, Mark uh, Wheatley with the European Union um, of the, 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 the deaf. Um, and then from Age Platform, we have Joke de Ruter Vaniken. Um, and the Age Platform has been a key participant um, within the uh, SHIPS project. And of course, we're very uh, grateful to them today uh, for also uh, doing the technical facilitation um, of, of this webinar. So we then go to the Slido again, um, have more participation, hopefully from you, but we don't want you to wait to participate. We want you to also use the chat function as we go on. Um, we'll uh, have our panel uh, responses and then we'll wrap up from there.
So um, I think without any further um, delay, um, we'll go to Katya uh, Sidel and Jamie Saris um, from Maynooth. Um, good morning and over to Yi, Katya and Jamie. Um, Can we you can't hear, hear you yet. You can't hear us yet? Ah, we can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. Can you also see us? Does it yeah, we can see you and hear you and you're looking good. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, Mac, for the introduction um, and for kindly giving us this chance to start off um, the content of what we've done, so to say, in shapes, as you said, as some of the kind of foundational work, hopefully distributed throughout all the work packages and having had a wonderful influence um, throughout the project. Um, yeah, we have been in charge of Work Package 2.1, uh, working with older people directly and um, doing ethnographic research with them, learning about their lives and their life worlds. And I have Jamie start um, by giving you a little bit of an overview. And then it's my great pleasure afterwards to introduce Helmut Lutzmann to you, who specifically came today to share his experience that he had with us um, during the project and also his own work in the Senior Academy in Dresden. Thanks, Katia. Um, can everybody hear me okay? I'll take in silence, there's consent. Okay. Yes, um, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> um, as Mac um, already suggested, Shapes is relatively unique in the way it set about integrating uh, sort of rich descriptions of the lives of older people into the foundation of the Shapes ecosystem. Such descriptions go beyond um, what we generally conceive of as use cases and piloting um, that are usually associated with the rollout of technological solutions to, to any particular human problem. Um, the operating ethos of shapes, that is look, understand, and then act for the development and implementation of the platform, wanted to avoid a problem that is unfortunately too easy to find in the development of technological fixes to social and human problems. Um, that is the tendency to proliferate solutions to problems that are themselves only poorly understood. A key part then of both the look and understand moments of this process in shapes was ethnographic research, which was led in, in Maynooth um, by myself and Katya here, and our colleague David Prendergast, who was not able to attend this session. Um, and this was this research was um, necessarily forced to change because it uh, was designed to roll out in March 2020. And while this is not that long ago, it does seem like a kind of age ago in another sense because there was a global pandemic in between then and now. Um, this transformed our methodology and radically expanded the number of uh, individuals with whom we had contact um, because it forced us to go online and it also forced us to recruit um, individuals who were part of the, the shapes ecology uh, working in other capacities to talk to people, uh, older people in the settings in which um, um, they were actually working. Um, <clears throat> In effect, these uh, uh, the so we just about doubled the original number of folks that we were talking to, and the actual ethnography lasted a bit longer um, online um, of various levels of, of uh, interaction. Um, but the end result of these interactions are what um, anthropologists call uh, thick descriptions. And I'm going to give a little bit of background on that. Um, for the shapes ecosystem as a whole, though, um, Work Package 2.1 um, got a section of the Maynooth website called hashtag shapes stories. And if people haven't had a chance to look at that, it is a summary of several of the interactions that we've had over the course of the last three and a half years or so, three and a three quarters years or so. Um, 
that uh, are organized around some of the central themes that we investigated uh, within the, the, the program. And that was designed in, um, uh, with an eye to injecting the data that we were gathering uh, directly into the shapes ecosystem that didn't need to be mediated by a report or a document that you know everybody probably wouldn't necessarily read. Anthropologists call the accounts that they develop from these long-term engagements with the life worlds of others thick description. Thick description embraces, embraces complexity not merely for its own sake, but because human lives are in fact complex, while interventions tend not to be. This siloed approach to real people in concrete social historical circumstances often results in a flattening of social life from this perspective from, of one professional lens, breaking apart the very experiences that real people conceive of as all of a piece. Financial concerns, for example, can spiral into feelings of anxiety and lack of self-worth that get read as depression from another perspective, say that of a professional healthcare provider. Um, and this potentially mobilizes various formal care interventions, not all of which are necessarily appropriate. Similarly, barriers to mobility can make a range of other facets of the life world significantly more challenging, um, requiring perhaps extra interventions to maintain social networks. The key principle of ethnography then is one that is often seen as quite reasonable when we say it out loud, but one that is actually challenging to adhere to in most other scientific methods. Stated simply, ethnographers take subjects as an expert in their own lives, not the only expert to be sure, and perhaps a source of expertise that may not even be the last word, but nonetheless an important source of knowledge necessary to consult as a condition of successfully intervening within that life and context. When the lives of older people are approached in this fashion, we find a very different picture than the one driving much of the discourse in the public culture about older uh, individuals. Discussions about rising health care costs and the social implications of an aging population, what is often referred to in many EU circles as the silver tsunami. Instead, we find older people as complex beings, as often giving as receiving care not just to their partners and other, and their other contemporaries, but also to the generation below. Parenting is not a, a for those of you who are parents, is not something that has an endpoint. Um, we also find that old age, not merely as a, it is not merely a drawn out ending, a slow withdrawal from social, cultural, and economic life, but instead a time of potential, rife with new opportunities. And here we see technological solutions in a different light as having the ability to do more than merely make up deficits. They can also enhance strengths, allowing for novel cultural, economic, and social opportunities. And this I think is a good introduction to the, the speaker that people really want to hear in this section of uh, the Shapes Dialogue Workshop. And that is uh, Herr Luzman talking about the Senior Academy and some of the um, ideas and uh, successes that they have had in Dresden. Um, yeah, thank you, Jamie. Um, just uh, maybe a few words before we hand over directly to Helmut Lutzmann. Um, because I was the one who was fortunate enough to actually be spending my time uh, with Mr. Lutzmann. Um, he was one of the 10 participants in our research sample in the people we, re we interacted with in Dresden or the surrounding areas. And um, I am incredibly indebted to all of them because uh, the insights they shared with me their intimate experiences from all of their life, their life circle, the way they think about family, the way they think about illnesses and health, and the way they think about education was incredibly enriching to me personally, and then to the SHAPES project in general. Because from all the stories that we gathered, not only in Dresden, but in 10 different pilot sites, um, in throughout Europe 
and also from people uh, living with deaf blindness and deaf communities, we ended up with 104 individuals who actually shared their, um, their life stories and their insights with us. So we ended up with no less than 415 hours of qualitative interviews from which we now drew these insights and disseminated them throughout the SHAPES project to improve, so to say, um, the way in which we can understand the life worlds of older people and the ways in which designers and our colleagues who are working on the SHAPES platform and in the pilots can see and develop the um, smart technologies and digital innovations for the future for older people. Um, and Helmut Lutzmann specifically, um, he is like he's nowadays a retiree, but um, he surely hasn't stopped working. And I'm therefore very grateful that he actually joins us today because he is always very busy, not only with um, a very large patchwork family um, in which he is not only um, four children, but also nine grandchildren, um, where he has a lot of care activities um, and where he's enjoying this. He's also a keen gardener. And of course, um, given his life um, and his career's background of being a microbiologist, um, and a very successful manager of a, of a food company in an international setting um, back in the day. He nowadays still continues to work as a lecturer, as um, a peer who shares with other older people the idea of um, constantly and continuously learning. Um, and one of the things uh, that really impressed me was that within the little time that he has, he, know, he spent with me no less than 12 hours um, of, of conversations online during the pandemic. And I'm more than grateful for that. Uh, and the one thing that really stood out for me was the motto that um, Mr. Lutzmann holds for his life, which is, you need something, you need something to look forward to every day. And we are very much looking forward to his presentation now. And I hope that this presentation is also something that he was able to look forward to. Helmut Lutzmann, if you are there, the floor is yours, please. Well, thank you so much for this great introduction. And I'm very much delighted to be able to tell you about uh, the experience we have had uh, with our SHAPES project at the Dresden Senior Academy. Just a moment to hold on. Do you hear me on the English Channel? You do? Yes, yes? we do. Yeah. I see a thumbs up uh, from the sign uh, language interpreter yeah so you do hear me on the english channel i hope yes yeah yeah yes yes well once again thank you so much for your great introduction and I'd like to tell you about the experience and the implementation we've had so uh, uh, of our shapes project at the dresden senior academy over the past few years well, I'm responsible for marketing and uh, everything that's digital at board level. And we've set a few priorities for our today's event uh, that you will see on the next slide, please. Yeah, next slide, please. Well, we have set a few priorities uh, for our, my today's talk. Uh, well, the most important one probably being the fact that uh, our motto is health through education. Uh, that is one of our main priorities. And a second priority is the 
to in, enable participation in uh, our digital social life. Because digitization actually is continuing uh, at a high pace. Uh, and the third uh, priority will be to create uh, uh, a barrier-free education this because in particular the age group of the elderly of uh, senior citizens uh, they uh, have uh, certain limitations uh, rise a high uh, number of limitations so, uh, for instance with regard to mobility and as a an education institution we have to uh, put a clear focus on barrier free education. And as a last point, I would like to give you some uh, information on our uh, organization being the Dresden Senior Citizens Academy and what are our uh, plans for the future. Next slide, please. Well, on the first priority, education or health or health through education. I think I'm not telling you a secret uh, when I'm saying that uh, education makes your brain fit. Uh, when you uh, deal with things, uh, uh, look at things, uh, it makes your brain work. And that is very good for your health, so for your mental health. And, uh, and we can uh, rightly expect good results when senior citizens deal with these uh, topics. And there are numerous studies uh, that have demonstrated uh, the positive effect when you deal with certain topics, uh, for instance, education, that your brain becomes active again. And there are very interesting examples for this. In our next semester, we will have a lecture that will actually deal with uh, how dementia can uh, be influenced in a positive way or uh, how dementia can be delayed or uh, how uh, uh, it can even be prevented from uh, breaking out from uh, showing uh, its symptoms through education. So we have to point out to senior citizens that they have uh, to continue educating them because it's a very important factor for their good health. Next slide, please. So education uh, versus medicine or instead of medication. So, uh, well, education, of course, uh, requires financial means. Uh, uh, so not everybody uh, has uh, the means necessary, for instance, to buy a mobile phone, a smartphone. People sometimes do not have the money for that. And therefore, we as the Senior Citizen Academy, we advocate for making education vouchers available to our senior citizen. I think it's much better uh, to provide them with these vouchers instead of actually prescribing and then paying medication for them as soon as uh, they start having symptoms of dementia. So it is all about lifelong learning where we try to find topics that are also of interest for seniors. So there is a project of the Senior of Dresden on life learning for senior citizens where the seniors uh, uh, are involved in a, a great array of different education opportunities. Of course, they have to be interesting for seniors. So they have to take interest in them. And then uh, the participation and uh, digital life. I think this is a prerequisite for these seniors uh, to take part in this uh, digital life and not to be excluded uh, from it. And we have to 
ensure that the seniors uh, have the um, competences and the capabilities uh, to uh, deal with these uh, digital devices. Uh, so we have to enable them by training courses uh, and show to them, explain to them how to use a smartphone, for instance. So that is one of the offers we are making now. And there are a lot of different uh, opportunities and possibilities uh, that we uh, unfortunately can only uh, use uh, via the internet or, well, sometimes this is even an advantage to be able to uh, use them uh, on the internet. And their exclusion or their loneliness uh, uh, can uh, th thus be reduced or even be prevented by uh, heavily focusing on education and by giving the senior citizens the opportunity to have easy access to uh, this education offer. Next slide, please. And uh, to this end, it is important that we actually organize uh, these trainings uh, in order to uh, give our seniors the opportunities and open up doors for them to take part in these uh, educational uh, offers. And of course, you may not be afraid to take part in uh, those. And uh, it is also one of our tasks to remain, to remove, excuse me, uh, these uh, fears and to, to show uh, how they can best use all these communication tools, uh, uh, a smartphone, the internet, uh, and so forth and uh, also to deal with uh, the uh, entire security issue uh, whilst using uh, these uh, technologies to have a good access uh, uh, to these offers. And the use of smartphones and tablet computers for are very important to very many different uh, users. Many apps that we have nowadays can make our lives easier. And also in particular, these uh, health care or health apps that are very useful in particular to senior citizens. Next slide, please. Then the barrier-free education. Oh, just to give you one bit of information, well, senior citizens are uh, not a very homogeneous group. They are quite heterogeneous. And therefore, uh, making use of education it may uh, largely vary due to their experience with education. And we tried actually to uh, um, involve them uh, uh, where they currently stand uh, uh, with their uh, experience with education uh, in order not to overburden them with uh, too much uh, education. And uh, but not uh, to bore them either. So as a uh, education uh, institution for senior citizens, we also have to try new concepts, new approaches uh, for them in order to ensure that uh, all those that have certain constraints or uh, limitations uh, may also benefit and can benefit from all these uh, offers. So today uh, we also benefit uh, from uh, sign language interpretation, but uh, thanks to uh, artificial uh, intelligence, we also have now uh, audio uh, description of images uh, uh, 
uh, we are a rather small scale organization. Nevertheless, so we try to solve a lot of issues we have uh, by means of these uh, new technologies and find the right solutions. Uh, and uh, we are now also uh, recording uh, this our today's event and we will later also have it translated or add uh, subtitles uh, uh, to uh, uh, the recording so that the senior citizens can also uh, still benefit from our today's event uh, uh, after um, our today's talk. Next slide, please. Well, I have actually told you about the three main priorities we are currently uh, focusing on. And this is uh, a basis uh, to actually uh, have uh, uh, very good acceptance uh, by uh, the senior uh, citizens of uh, Dresden. We have approximately 300 different events, uh, two uh, very different uh, topics. These uh, may be lectures, concerts, uh, educational uh, trips or excursions. Uh, uh, and uh, lectures uh, are becoming actually increasingly important and available. We see this actually as one of our main focuses in the future. And uh, so uh, we uh, even have other parties now uh, getting involved from different actually uh, areas, uh, not uh, only senior citizens uh, and our events uh, uh, are of course uh, presential events uh, so face to face uh, but we also have hybrid offers uh, so both uh, presential and online so uh, our uh, senior citizens may freely choose so whether they want to come and listen to our lectures in an auditorium uh, or uh, whether they prefer to listen to it uh, from uh, their private homes on a screen. So there are quite a few of them who prefer to attend online because it's easier for them, but others uh, like prefer to come to the auditorium because would they would like to have a private conversation during or after the event. So what is important if, to me now is to um, show you a few examples of how uh, the Senior Citizen Academy of Dresden um, tries to deal with uh, the digital transformation all around Dresden and to give you a few practical examples uh, of how we do this. Uh, and it is a good thing, I think, of bringing people together by these means. And I think the results of your your work uh, will be of uh, high importance and create a good uh, basis uh, uh, for all different kinds of uh, organizations and association of uh, senior citizens all around Europe and provide uh, them with good applications. And I wish you uh, the best of success and a lot of joy for that. Last slide, please. All right. I One, once again, thank you so much to all of you. And if you have questions now, I'm of course available for possible questions now. Ja, vielen herzlichen Dank, Herr Lutzmann, für diesen Vortrag. Ähm, vielleicht könnten Sie noch kurz bei uns bleiben, äh, im Fall, dass es Fragen gibt. Ähm, ja, okay. Um, Mac or Vera, how are we handling the questions? Sure, thank, thank you. Uh, that was very good. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Lutzmann. Uh, and the translation was uh, excellent. So, so thank you, translators. Um, so this, this was a really uh, very stimulating uh, presentation. Um, and I, I really like the emphasis around uh, education as a lifelong 
activity and education as as stimulation um and that we we all need stimulation um all all the time uh, regardless of age and i think also what helmet uh, emphasized very much was the importance of education as a means to participation uh, in society um and, and i like the the idea that it's not digital or in person interaction but it's actually the the combination uh, of of the two of them um so i think j just looking on at the um uh, the comments uh, on on the chat uh, you know people are very positive um about this uh, presentation um and it really calls up what what is happening for instance in in dresden and asks us whether uh, there are other centers in europe that are doing similar things um and of course there are to some extent but one of the the functions um of european projects in general is to try and make sure that there's equal opportunities uh, around different um uh, countries within europe and within different uh, urban and rural settings uh, within these different countries. Um, so I think there, there's much that can be learned uh, from the uh, senior uh, uh, academy um, within uh, Dresden that uh, Helmut has presented us with here. And uh, he worked Sorry? Yeah. Sorry? Oh, it's gone now. There is a question in the Q&A section, um, maybe the... It's button. in the chat now. Vasilis oh, also put it in the chat. Okay, ah, because the, the Q&A is not actually opening for me for some... Right. Yeah, so there is a question there. Um, vielleicht yeah. wir haben noch den, die Übersetzung, richtig? Ich, ich no, nicht. yeah, but we only do German-English, not English-German. We only oh, do German okay. English. Good. Aber um, ich kann ja. gerne übersetzen. Oder Katja, kannst du? Wie du möchtest, Vera. Mach ruhig. Um, also die Frage an Herrn Lutzmann war, ob es Ihnen vorkommt, dass wir manchmal die Technologie zu sehr ah, den, den älteren Menschen aufdrängen, weil es für die Entwickler der Technologie und der Forscher so, that interessant ist. For Mr. Lutzmann. Um, Are we not imposing too much this new technology to senior citizens? It is not overloading them. And how do you see the interaction between the human being and the, these technology? Yes, of course, this is also uh, a challenge for us. Uh, but I think uh, the easiest way to convince senior citizens uh, that it is to their benefit is to point out to them that it is to their advantage. Just to give you one example from my private life, actually, my mother-in-law is 84 years old. I wanted to convince her to uh, buy a smartphone uh, and her, her great-grandson uh four years old he said to her well uh, uh granny uh when i actually uh call uh other members of the families i can also see them on the screen you i can only hear and i would like to see you as well i think this is just one easy example um, to um, actually convince uh, our senior citizens or make them even more enthusiastic about these technologies there's always this first hurdle that we need to overcome uh, uh, when it comes to convincing them that they really want it uh, and you have to point out that uh, there is an added value for them personally in their private lives. And uh, there you have also to embark on uh, face to ways, uh, sorry, face to face talk with these people in order to efficiently convince them. There's another uh, question where we do not have all that much time left. Well, uh, now. Uh, we are receiving more and more questions. One question would be 
do you also make these technologies available at the Senior Citizen Academy? Do you also um, offer for smartphones or tablet computers, especially for those uh, who do not have all that much money? Uh, we do not make these offers as uh, the Senior Citizen Academy that the city of Dresden actually uh, offers uh, certain grants, uh, uh, so uh, financial uh, support uh, to our senior citizens, for instance, to enable them to buy a smartphone. We also cooperate with a high number of different partners. I think there are 40 of them ranging from the city of Dresden, the University of Dresden, and so many others. We also cooperate with companies, uh, businesses uh, uh, that sometimes even uh, give us uh, 20 smartphones for our uh, educational office and from Baxo, which is another uh, organization in our area, we received uh, many uh, digital uh, end devices and then the senior citizens come to, uh, to see us uh, and they we explain to them we explain to them how these devices actually work. For instance, a suction robot. They may even take them hold and try them out themselves. Then there is this digital, actually, uh, uh, walking stick for the blind. And we have a cooperation uh, with uh, uh, Institute for Technology uh, where they uh, may test uh, these uh, devices themselves because sometimes they are a bit hesitant uh, to accept these devices. But if uh, you offer them, hey, you may test them for free for, let's say, a fortnight, uh, very often we are able to convince them that these devices are very useful for them and they decide to keep them. So it's all about to this hurdle and um, try to have the hurdle as low as possible. And if you these offers are uh, uh, free of charge, uh, the hurdle is of course a lot lower than um, uh, where in a situation where people would have immediate pay for them. And that's... Uh, takes us even to other questions. Uh, how uh, you try uh, to convince the citizens uh, by this uh, hands-on approach? I would like to take yet another question, but do we still have time for another question? Or do we have to uh, draw this uh, yeah. session to a close? Mac. Yeah, well, well, thank you, uh, Helmut. I, I think you have stimulated lots of uh, really interesting questions. And what I would ask people to do is to stay with us because we will have opportunity for, for uh, these questions again uh, at the end. But I would like to try and keep us um, on time. Um, and that would mean that we would have a 10-minute break uh, now, which would take us up to... Uh, 11 o'clock uh, German time um, and uh, 10 o'clock uh, Irish time and uh, everyone else can coordinate their, their two times uh, in relation to these because um, at 11 o'clock German time we will stay uh, in Germany. Um, we will uh, come back to Sonia um, who will describe some of the uh, outcomes from our pilots and I think Helmut, in talking about, uh, for instance, digital walking sticks, et cetera, has given us a lovely uh, teaser for um, some of the results of our uh, excellent uh, uh, technology that has been uh, piloted. Um, but uh, really, thank you so much, uh, Helmut. Um, you've really brought the uh, experience uh, to life for us and made a very strong uh, case, uh, both from your own experience and for advocating for, for more sort of equitable access throughout Europe to uh, initiatives like the uh, Senior Ac Academy. So on behalf of the SHAPES Consortium, um, thank you so much for the presentation. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone back here in 
nine minutes now. So, <laughs> don't yeah, yeah, thank you, Shane. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, uh, again, just looking at some of the comments uh, in the chat there. Um, Sabine is asking, do you agree that digitization will increase more and more in old age? Because uh, future older generations will grow up with it. And I think that's certainly the case. Um, but uh, one of the things we've also found uh, through the experience of uh, COVID in particular was the, the rate of increase in terms of uh, what Helmut had talked about in, uh, as the, the, the competence, the capacity to use um, digital and assistive technologies rapidly uh, increased uh, during COVID. So I think it's certainly the case um, that uh, younger generations will use it increasingly more as, as they age. But there seems to be very good evidence that our, our contemporary older people uh, are also using it much more than they were, for instance, five years ago. Um, and is there a contact uh, person for donations of used equipment? Um, I think that's a really good uh, question. And um, that's obviously going to be different in each case, but maybe in terms of the um, senior academy in uh, Dresden, that that's something that we could uh, respond to either... Um, from uh, Helmut or someone else who's familiar with the academy there. So as I say, uh, sticking with our uh, German theme, we, we actually have uh, 14 different uh, countries involved in shapes, but we're uh, starting very strongly with uh, Germany this morning. And um, we're now going over to Sonia, who, as I say, um, oversaw the by far the largest work package uh, within the SHAPES project and is now going to share the results, recommendations and some reflections. Sonia, good morning. Yeah, hi, good morning, Mac. I'm Sonia Grigoleit. I'm a red-haired Caucasian woman and I'm around 40-something years old. And I work for Fraunhofer INT in, in Germany. I Currently, I'm leading the SHAPES European pilot campaign. Now I would like to give you some of our findings, um, the things that went well, the things that went not so well, and also to give you some recommendation for further large-scale pilots. Uh, next slide, please. Um, overall, we had 25 use cases, and they were piloted in 15 different pilot sites all over Europe. In these pilots, we had more than 400 participants, older persons and also caregivers. And if we also count the persons who participated in the mock-up tests and prototype tests, then there were more than 800 uh, participants in our pilot campaign. What do we mean with went well? This means that in the evaluation, we got very positive um, marks both in the usability, user friendliness, user acceptance, and on the other hand, also in a positive impact on the life of the participants, might be the physical um, health or the health related quality of life. Next, I would like to give you three examples of use cases which went exceptionally well. The first one is um, long-lasting memories care. This is a digital tool and it includes both um, applications for a physical training, which uh, persons can see on the screen, and also a cognitive training with games-like applications with different pictures. This pilot was piloted in Greece with eight participants and also in Germany with five participants. And the evaluation has shown that um, we got very positive uh, marks, both in um, improvement in the physical health, for example, in the walking ability or in the static balance, in the health-related quality of life, which we measured with questionnaires, for example, from the World Health Organization, and also in patient perspectives themselves, the user experience. The next example would be um, the 
dance move, which is an application where they have a dance mat on the floor with arrows and the participants see on a screen, like on a laptop or tablet, indications how to move with the music. So they see arrows on the screen and they have to move on the dance mat accordingly. This pilot was piloted in Portugal with 30 participants and also in Greece and in the Czech Republic. And also here we got very positive findings, both in the improvement of the physical function, for example, the gait speed of the persons in the health related quality of life, and also in the patient perspective, like the user acceptance and the usability. Um, another example is physical rehabilitation at home. Here we have a smart mirror for persons who had an accident or stroke and now have to undergo rehabilitation at home. So they see the movement on the screen and also get feedback via the screen and they can do the rehabilitation at home or also in a nursing home. This pilot was piloted in Spain with 15 participants and got very positive remarks, both in the clinical effectiveness, for example, in the joint amplitude, how they move their shoulder and the hip, and also in the patient perspective, the usability and technology acceptance. Now we come to the more awkward things, the thing that went not so well. Here we have got a group of use cases where the user acceptance and usability was very positive and got very good marks, but um, the health related quality of life there we didn't really see a, a big difference before and after the pilot. So here we think uh, that we have to repeat these pilots or someone has to repeat this pilot with more participants or with um, longer intervention times to really observe uh, changes in the health related quality of life. And we also have a group of uh, pilots where we had more challenges. And next slide, please. Uh, these use cases uh, contain several digital solutions from technical partners from many different European countries and also several procured devices. Um, these use cases were, were a victim of the COVID-19 pandemic because and during the two years with travel restrictions, it was not possible to bring them all to one site and test them all together regarding um, data transfer integration issues. So they're here, we get some delays. Another challenge were the voice assistants. Originally, we only um, saw, saw that we can include English and Spanish, but as the pilot sites have been very interested in voice assistance with other languages like German or Portuguese, um, we also included the voice assistant later on in the project, um, but the customization period was quite time consuming. Next slide, please. So what are our recommendations for further large-scale pilots? Um, well, our most important recommendation is to have more face-to-face -face meetings. That was our learnings from the COVID-19 um, pandemic, that we really have to be all at the same side, the technical partners, the pilot sites, to be really able to test um, the different uh, digital solutions, devices at the pilot site. Another recommendation is to consider the complexity. Of course, it is easier to have just one um, technical solution in one use case and then to have five or seven. Um, it is also important to have sufficient budget uh, in your project because if you want to recruit persons and this person perhaps does not have a router or doesn't have a tablet or does not have a good stable Wi-Fi connection, then we can procure these devices and this way are able to recruit this person. It is also important to have a local network of health professionals who are really enthusiastic about the technology. If they have a network of persons with um, a high confidence um, and a good working condition between the patients and the um, enthusiastic healthcare provider, then the recruitment is much easier. 
We also learned that the pre-checks for the use cases with the Momentum and NAS framework um, are very helpful. Momentum is a set of critical success factors and NAS is the framework which detects complexities in the use case. So we did it before the pilot started and was quite helpful to adapt the use case if there have been any challenges. Our main evaluation, um, we have done it with key performance indicators and also the impact on the overall life of the participants. This was done with the MUST framework, the model of assessment of telemedicine applications. This was also quite helpful for us. Um, our main learning in this area was that we shouldn't include too many questionnaires in the evaluation. So the interview with the participants shouldn't take more than 20 minutes because more time would mean that the participant are exhausted after, in after the interviews. Another learning was that if we would like to observe uh, changes in the health related quality of life, it is important to recruit large number of participants and also to have long intervention periods, perhaps even up to 12 months to really see a difference. Um, we also included open calls in the SHAPES project to be able to include new technology in the project. Um, and it is important to do it as early in the project as possible so that these open call solutions also have time for integration and testing as much as the um, technical solution of the SHAPES partners themselves. The testing phase is very important and we should allow for lot of time for this testing to be able to fiddle out all the different um, interconnection data transfer uh, challenges which might occur when all uh, digital solutions work together. And the final recommendation is that we should aim for a balance between data protection and user friendliness. Of course, it is very safe to have a password with 20 digits, but it's not very user friendly. So we have to find a balance for so that it's still usable for the participants, but still safe for them to use it. Thank you. That would be all from my side. I think Stacy has prepared a slide from Slider to get your opinion. Yeah, just bear with me one moment, please. Thank, thank you, Sonia. And um, one of the things that uh, I guess it struck me is where you described earlier on that sometimes people have um, positive experiences of using technology, but it doesn't necessarily result in an improvement in the quality of life um, that, that they have. Um, so you know that that's one sort of if you like um paradox um and then the another paradox which i also think is very nice is where you emphasize that in order for us to use digital technology effectively we need to actually come together um as as a group uh, within the research project because i think very often people feel that there's a danger of digital technology making us move apart from each other. Um, whereas one of our learnings here is we need a lot more physical meetings where people are together to really understand how best from a research perspective to um, uh, promote the use of digital uh, technologies, et cetera. So thank you um, for, for those uh, strengths, challenges and recommendations. And please uh, make comments in, in the chat. Um, Stacey, um, shall I uh, hand over to you to explain what you're doing? Perfect. So. Looks very impressive. I am Stacey Gamble, who is the project manager of the Shapes uh, project in Maynooth University. Um, as I see from the engagement, you've already started interacting with our Slido. Um, so I am a white woman with blonde hair and I'm wearing a black top. Um, for everyone that's interacting, if you would like to participate with our um, Slido presentation, 
you just either log on to your um, internet browser, type in slido.com, and then you can add in the number 17111007. Or if you have a QR scanner on your device, you can scan the QR code that I've shared on the screen. So we are asking a multiple choice question. What do you think are the main challenges of large scale pilots in the area of healthy aging? So we have, it's, it's switching continuously. We have integration issues between several digital solutions and devices. We have engagement of participants, which seems to be taking the lead. Lack of time, administrative problems, maturity of technical solution, and communication between project partners and management issues. Um, as we've said, thank you very much, Vera, for popping it into the chat. If you would like to participate via our chat function, that is no problem. We'll just do this very momentarily, um, following on from Sonia's presentation so as not to slow down the general um, running of today's event. Okay. So you can keep adding to that as the um, event goes on and we can check in at the end if you'd like. Okay, that, that's uh, brilliant, Stacey. Thank you so much. Um, so there, there you are, um, some, I guess, technology uh, in action. And uh, we want you to keep uh, sort of interacting with us, both through the, the Slido, as Stacey has said, um, and through your comments on, uh, on chat. Um, and we'd be particularly uh, keen to hear uh, just some of your thoughts around uh, both uh, the, the sort of strengths that Sonia's described, some of the challenges, and indeed some of our uh, recommendations. Um, so there is Sonia saying thank you and showing a, a picture of, of some of the 300 plus people who've been employed uh, in the SHIPS uh, project over the last uh, four years, as I said, working across uh, 14 different uh, countries. So that uh, picture was taken in uh, Thessaloniki in the, the north of uh, Greece. And we're all looking very uh, relaxed there. We're getting a bit less relaxed as we come to the end of the project and we've still got a good bit of work to do. But um, I think it's now my pleasure to hand over to my uh, colleague, uh, Michael. Are you there, Michael? I'm here, yeah. Ah, uh, great. Yeah, thank you, Mac. I, I was so... going to introduce you as the guy with the hat in the previous photograph, but I don't need to do that because you have a different hat. It's, and it's, it's quite a different hat pilot. because the weather has changed, Mac. Okay, okay. Can say, okay, good morning, everyone. Stacey, you're controlling the slides, is that right? That's correct, yes. Great, thank you. So good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Cook, Minuth University. Uh, I'm a white uh, Caucasian uh, male, uh, somewhat bald, but that's not the reason why I wear a hat, but I am wearing a gray fedora with a, with a yellow feather. Okay. So today I'd like to talk about some of the work we've been doing in uh, Work Package 3, which is organizational, structural, and socio-technical factors for the SHAPES ecosystem, and particularly looking at how we uh, are trying to map the role that technology plays in people's lives on, on a, let's say, in the course of a day, engaging in various different activities. And the main purpose of this is to guide uh, and develop a set of guidelines to help, uh, guidelines and tools to help um, end users implement uh, shapes tools within their organizational system, bearing in mind that the key purpose of that organizational system is to support the lives of, uh, of the people living within it. And the purpose of the technology is to, um, is to assist in that and to uh, make their lives better, uh, ideally, and that's the goal. But we need to keep a close eye on the question, is the technology or is any given technological component actually delivering uh, benefits to the people uh, involved? Can you move on, please, Stacey? So uh, I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, how we approached elaborating the socio-technical details of living with uh, shapes. 
uh, particularly in the context of the pilot sites that uh, Sonia was just talking about. So we were looking closely at the uh, the use cases that were that were uh, rolled out in the pilot sites, uh, of various different purposes and various different kinds, using different kinds of technologies. But at the center all of, of all of those is the Shapes platform, but integrating different kinds of data from different types of technologies. So with a focus on the social and organizational aspects. So other parts of the project focused on the technological the development of the technological capabilities and integrating those together. Our focus in this uh, work was to focus was to uh, elaborate on the, um, the social and organizational aspects. And what I mean by socio-technical is simply how um, in an organizational context, the, you know, people working and living together, their lives are mediated or facilitated by technology. Uh, we can think about that in, in most kinds of organizations like a hospital, it's a socio-technical environment where you have people working together, but they're highly dependent on technology. But nowadays, we could even say that our homes and our community, it's our socio-technical uh, um, environments because so much of our lives uh, are reliant on things like smartphones and um, uh, tablets and, and uh, you know smart tablets, computers, and so on, the internet. So we, we do live constantly in a, in a digital world, digital ecosystem, which can be said, considered a socio-technical environment. And one of the things, one of the other things that we're looking to do is support the implementation, like I said, but also evaluate the utility and suitability of technologies for people's activities. So it's not just, is this an easier way to manage somebody with a certain condition, but is this a better way for that person to be able to go about their daily life? Uh, we've taken a human activity-centered approach using uh, CONOPS, and I'll talk about that briefly. CONOPS stands for Concept of Operations. But the human activity-centered approach is more than just a human-centered approach, but it's based on the assumption that the human is active. Uh, so we're talking about active and healthy aging. So some of you may be familiar with the term user-centered or human-centered design, and that's about trying to match technology with the characteristics and capacities and capabilities of individuals and, and groups. But the human activity centered approach is also looking at that in a much more dynamic way. So looking at the individual as engaged in various activities, social activities, physical activities, cognitive mental activities, uh, and, and so on. So this is something that we're trying to uh, build into the framework that we that we're developing. Uh, and then guide to guide in order to guide sustainable implementation. So what we're offering here is not simply a snapshot of what we did in shapes, but also a methodology for continuously doing that using the human activity centered CONOPS approach, CONOPS standing for concept of operations. You can move on, please, Stacey. So you, you can just click through all of those. So a concept of operations sounds like a complex thing, but it's really the answer or the process of answering a, a set of simple questions. The process of getting the answers to those questions is a bit more complex, but the questions themselves are quite simple. That is, who are we dealing with? Who are we designing and developing a system? Who are we trying to support? Is it your care recipients? Is it your caregivers? your professional or your informal caregivers? Is it policymakers? Is it uh, 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 medical professionals, including those on, on the managerial side in, in terms of managing um, care facilities, hospitals, and so on? Uh, is it researchers? Or is it all of the above who are in one way or another involved in shapes? If you can go back, please, Stacey. Yeah, thank you. The next question is why? What is the motivation? In other words, what are we trying to achieve ultimately by the system, by shapes in this case? What outcomes are we, do we want to deliver? What KPIs do we want to improve on? In what ways do we want to improve people's lives? The what is, what are the key elements that we are introducing here? Uh, we have the platform, but what digital solutions? Uh, either the, whether it's the ones that we bring in through the project or the ones that can be available through the marketplace. The when is what is the time sequence of activities that will be performed. So a concept of operations is uh, a visualization of 
what operational life or what daily life, if you like to put it that way, it will be like in the future for people engaged in the system, engaged in that organizational system involving shapes. Sorry, if you can go back, please, uh, Stacey. Uh, the where is the geographical distribution. So not everybody is in a, in a single location. Some very often, in fact, for almost everybody, we've got family, friends, um, professionals, caregivers, and so on that are distributed geographically. And then what resources do we need to design and build the system? So we need more than just technologies. We need inf information and data. We need money and finance. We need uh, human resources. We need a whole variety of different resources that are involved in uh, addressing the how of how we implement this. Now you can move on. Uh, thanks, Stacey. So um, when we're uh, talking about a person, an individual within such a system, we look at the individual as not just uh, an isolated individual with certain needs and certain characteristics and certain diagnostic uh, criteria and so on. But that person exists in a much more complex uh, social environment. So every subject, every person, individual, whether it's a citizen, care recipient, uh, caregiver, relatives, GPs, hospital, hospital managers, care homes, health administrators, and so on. They're not just, you know, uh, existing uh, uh, passively, but they're, like I said before, engaged in, in activities. In each, of the, in each of those activities, they're trying to do something, trying to achieve a goal, whether it's to socialize, whether it's to uh, have a good diet, whether it's to exercise, whether it's to uh, monitor their, their medication and make sure that they take their medication. Or it could be that you're trying to ensure that the other person is doing all of these things to an appropriate uh, extent. So we got everybody trying to achieve an object or an objective, if you like, with an intended or desired outcome. And the key thing at the top of this uh, triangle or pyramid is the tools that we use to do that. And in this case, we're, we're talking about the shapes tools, whether it's the shapes platform, the robotics, the, the biophotonic dashboard reminiscence uh, uh, related tools or the um, uh, whatever uh, systems that we're uh, integrating through the marketplace. These are intended to help the person, the individual achieve their outcome and uh, their object and their outcome. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks, Stacey. And then this all happens within a broader community. So everybody's interacting with other people. There's a division of labor. So every individual care recipient is interacting with caregivers who have their own set of goals and outcomes as well. And then you have the, the rules, the ethics, privacy, legal, procedural, uh, cultural rules as well that, uh, that govern, if you like, this, uh, this framework. So this is what, this is what the, the basis on which we're building the concept of operations. That's that future vision of shapes in, op in use in operational context. You can move on, please, Stacey. So this uh, complex uh, uh, mind map, if you like, is uh, an illustration of some of the answers that we get to, the, to those simple questions that I presented at the start. Uh, so when we talk about the who, we're talking about um, you know, uh, the different kinds of uh, participants and shapes, if you like. And then we're dealing with uh, you know, whether uh, we're dealing with questions of human factors, human capabilities interacting with technology. Uh, we're interacting with the health context, the description of, of each of the pilot sites, the, the geographical context, the, the demographical uh, aspects. We're dealing with the description of the health system that the, each pilot site is interacting with, uh, the different characteristics of the different technologies and so on, uh, the care pathways, uh, part of the health and social care system. So this is kind of a complex diagram, but it shows the, the, the range of complex, complexity that we're trying to manage here in the SHAPES project and trying to distill that into a usable representation that both the uh, care recipients, caregivers can utilize to try and understand how SHAPES interacts with them and how they interact with SHAPES, um, but also how the system developers uh, can adapt their technologies to the organizational environment. So you can move ahead. Thanks, Stacey. So uh, what we have used here, and uh, I should thank uh, Melanie Labor, who I think is on the uh, 
uh, is on the uh, webinar uh, for uh, doing a huge amount of work uh, to develop uh, these uh, swim lane diagrams or, or process maps. And what they are intended to do is for each of the use cases, like the ones that, uh, uh, that um, uh, Sonia outlined earlier, is to map in detail what each participant, each relevant participant in the use case is doing. And what we have here, if you can see that, is we have swim lanes like you have in a swimming pool. And each individual is occupying one of those swimming lane, swim lanes and moving from left to right, we can see the process of their activities throughout the day. And what's interesting here is that we're treating the shapes plat platform, the shapes technologies, so the central platform and the various components, just as another participant, not as the core participant, not as a central participant, not as the island in the middle of the pool that everybody is swimming around. It's just another participant. And you take out the platform, you still have the activities of all the other people. They'll just be doing it differently, as they will be doing it diff differently with the shapes technology in place. So I know you can't see this uh, because it's it's too small because it's a large a complex uh, diagram, but at the top here we have the care receiver, and uh, so this is the remote monitoring of key parameters at home. So monitoring things like sleeping, uh, heart rate, uh, uh, caloric intake, water intake, urination, uh, things like that. So using the various technologies to um, gather and process that information and provide a feedback to both the care recipient, but also their caregivers. So you can move from left to right, you're moving through the course of the, their day, their different activities. And at different times, we have different technologies, different uh, tools uh, or solutions kicking in, uh, dealing with either gathering information or sending uh, information. But like I said, the technology is only one participant. So here at the top, we have the care receiver. We have the, then the shapes platform and the, uh, the various solutions that integrate with that. Then down below, we have the informal and the professional caregivers who are also interacting with the, um, with the uh, care recipient. So the important thing about this is it allows us to see in what way and in what times of the day and throughout what which activities the shapes platform is impacting on the person's life. Uh, and then we can start to evaluate the quality of that uh, inter intervention. Next one, please, Stacey. So this is a slightly more compact one, but we're dealing with supporting the interaction of the individual with the community. So this is about, it's a different use case where we're looking at how the uh, platform and tools uh, like the, um, the FINA platform and the OMN DigiRoom uh, facilitates people communicating with each other and engaging in social activities that can be organized uh, in the community. So th this, this use case is about encouraging people to, to be more active and facilitating in that activity when it, when it comes to socialization. So again, we have the main user, we have the Shapes platform as just another participant in this. Uh, we have informal caregivers, we have community represent, uh, or community uh, as an actor, if you like, and we've potentially the researcher down at the bottom here. So in this version of it, we're including the researcher as a participant. Uh, so the technology provides capabilities. Those tech capabilities need to be experienced by the main care recipient or the main user, uh, but also by the community as a, as a whole. So the community is an actor within this use case and the informal caregiver uh, as, as well. So, the purpose of this is, is gives us a structure and a framework to be able to evaluate how the technology is impacting people's lives. And when I say evaluate that, I mean, it could be the case that some of these technologies in, in either any, any of the use cases are judged to be perhaps too intrusive or they're not useful enough or they're not usable enough or they cause a disruption uh, or a disturbance in the flow of a person's life or a person's activities throughout their day. So we're not just evaluating how the technology works from a usability point of view or from a, a simple effectiveness point of view in terms of gathering discrete data, but how it fits in overall to the structure of a person's life. Thanks, Stacey, you can move on. So finally, I'm gonna conclude with uh, that the points that Work Package 3 has produced extensive elaborations on the daily operational conditions and structures corresponding to identified use cases. Uh, and so we, we have, uh, all of the use cases have been uh, mapped uh, and studied uh, 
and, and uh, rendered into these uh, swim lanes. But the swim lane is only a tool. It's not a definitive representation of, uh, or normative representation of how shapes should be used. It's not a recommendation for how anybody should implement it. But it, it, it is a worked example of shapes in, in uh, interacting with, in the, the lives of, of people on a, on a day-to-day basis. The process of CONOPS development is a continuous loop. So it is, even after shapes is implemented, it should be done repeatedly to evaluate, continuously uh, assess as to the impact the shapes is having or that any individual technology is having on people's lives. And then sustainable implementation of the shapes ecosystem to support the daily activities of users requires collaboration and participation of all stakeholders. So this is not something that is done for or on behalf of the care recipients, but they need to be considered uh, as active participants within the process of developing the concept of operations and also evaluating it. Okay, so that's everything I have to say for uh, today. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for that um, uh, detailed review. And I, I hope people um, have got the impression that there's been a lot of uh, thinking through of how technology interacts, not just with individuals, but also with the broader systems um, that we uh, need to support those individuals. And that was a, an element uh, that was also raised by uh, Helmut uh, earlier this morning. Um, when he talked about the different sorts of in infrastructure that's needed to provide um, simple things like access to uh, internet and uh, digital skills and so on. So um, it's now my pleasure um, for us to go over to um, Lisbon uh, in Portugal um, and our colleague uh, Barbara uh, Guerra from um, Engineering which is, I guess, engineering at the edge. Is that right, Barbara? You are absolutely correct, Mac. Thank you so much for your kind introduction and greetings from Sunshine Lisbon in Portugal. So my name is Barbara Guerra um, and I am the CEO of Engineering, which is a company that is uh, building health and care uh, technologies uh, for a, a number of years. And uh, because I have a, a huge background in terms of marketing and business development, this is why we ended up also leading uh, Work Package 7 on the SHAPES project, which is dedicated to the exploitation elements and to the sustainability in the long term of the SHAPES results. Today, I'm here to present the SHAPES marketplace, which is one of our key exploitable results. So please, the, the next slide. Where to start? I'm going to start exactly at the beginning. So even from the proposal time, we already knew that there were a lot of barriers and challenges to the access uh, with respect to the health and care digital solutions. So we were quite aware that there was a large fragmentation on the industry market. We knew that there was a lack of awareness, not only about the existing health and care solutions, but also about their benefits to the users. Um, there was not uh, much harmonization in terms of regulation and standardization that dealt with not only with the health and care solutions, but also with the data, the health data that came from it. Um, and there was a generalized uh, impression that uh, health technologies would be very high cost and therefore very difficult to implement. This also compounded to the uh, reluctance of healthcare um, providers and even professionals to adopt these technologies in their daily uh, activities. So um, basically what we did was, in terms of next slide, is um, we have developed a number of different digital solutions because SHAPES was about the impact of health and care digital solutions in the, in the life world of the older individuals with respect to optimizing uh, their health, mental and physical well-being and also the participation on um, civic life while maintaining the dignified lives at home and preventing the development of uh, um, diseases that would uh, um, require them for the long-term institutionalized care. So we had developed 
adapted a number of digital solutions that ranged from, and you can see here in the image that I am showing, um, it is, uh, we had solutions like robots, assistive robots, we had solutions like health and well-being platforms, we had solutions like rehabilitation platforms that we also see here in another presentation from the pilots. And of course, we had AI-based data analytics that dealt with the information that came from the users with respect to sleep or physical activity, anomaly detection, and even prediction of the compensation episodes. So we had a broad range of different solutions um, that we needed to make sure were out there in terms of the facilitation of access and the awareness of their existence and benefits. And this is when we decided that it was probably uh, a good idea to include a shapes marketplace as, as one of the key results of the project. Um, so in September 2022, you know that the European Union presented the European Crace Strategy where they called for affordable, available, and accessible care services of high quality, and also the rollout of the accessible digital solutions for the delivery of care services. And this was exactly what we had thought five years before when we created Shapes um, and advocated this new paradigm of accessibility and affordability, availability of high quality health and care digital solutions through the Shapes Marketplace. So what we needed to do was to actually implement it. Next slide, please. So then we started with this building process and uh, throughout the course of 22 months, the Shapes partners using uh, co-creation methodology where we actively involve other individuals, health and uh, care providers, uh, and also health and care um, professionals to basically provide some of the bases that we use to build in terms of the technological solution, the marketplace. So one of the key aspects that we had was to define design approaches that were both inclusive and universal. And in this respect, we counted on the support from the European Union of the Deaf and the World Federation of the, Deaf, of the Blind Deaf, because they were absolutely instrumental to ensure that our marketplace would maximize on cultural acceptance, on inclusivity, and even adequacy to its purpose, which was to support the healthy aging, and also to its context, which was to provide these services for older individuals. Uh, and of course, that in the process, we also uh, consider um, security aspects to ensure the privacy and the protection of the personal data of all the users within our this uh, platform. Next slide, please. And so after 20 two months of work, intense work, uh, combining all the partners and even the ecosystem of stakeholders in shapes, uh, the marketplace was born. Uh, and it is basically a one-stop shop where you basically will see all the different solutions and services that will serve the silver economy. So the idea is like, like an Amazon type of platform where you will find um, an ecosystem of different digital solutions that users can search for, analyze, download and use um, or contact the providers to make sure that they have a bespoken type of solution for their organization. And the idea is that you will have here one place where you can more or less compare see what is there, understand the benefits of each of the solutions that are involved here. And there is a direct connection between the demand and the supply with full transparency to ensure that there is competitiveness between uh, the care industry, but also um, relevant information for the users that can then download and use these solutions. Also, at the same time, we were creating a viable business model for the SHAPES Consortium aiming for the long-term sustainability of our results. So today we have more than 40 digital solutions that were um, well integrated and demonstrated over several sites across Europe as in the presentation that Sonia mentioned here in the pilot. But more than that, we have gathered digital solutions coming from um, partners and from uh, the open calls that were basically individuals and the companies that had different solutions that wanted to be shown and really wanted to pursue this uh, method that we had in place 
of building this trust on the digital solutions in a way that they were co-developed with the older individuals to make sure that they engaged with the different solutions and were able to use them in the, in the pilot sites. So next slide. This is a slide where basically um, you have uh, the situation where we started, started to build specific principles within our marketplace. The first principle, as I mentioned, was trust, where by co-creating and adapting the digital solutions and even the marketplace to fit an inclusive audience, we were able to build this trustworthy environment where people felt free and, and uh, um, uh, at ease to use. Then there was the possibility to have fairness, transparency, and also competitiveness as mechanisms for the longer term uh, value for both the suppliers and the consumers. So the suppliers will be able to go into the marketplace, provide their own solutions and check on competition. And then they will see that probably they have to improve their own solutions, either by having a more competitive price or by providing additional services and always trying to strive for quality. So this is what we mean by adding to the competition and having a transparency within our uh, services. On the part of the consumers, they were able not only to see what was available, compare them, but they also would be able to have bespoken approaches, specifically addressing those suppliers that were within their local economies, for example, and local suppliers, and having them boost in terms of, of the offer that they would present to the different organizations or to local places. And overall, both suppliers and consumers would benefit uh, in terms of the marketplace from what we call predictable, uh, predictability, which is a possibility to balance a consistent capacity from offers and from the procurement. So when uh, situations arise where we have specific solutions that include uh, their delivery will take a longer time or where it may cost a lot of money, for example, the assistive robots, there is the possibility to engage them in longer term relationships that will ensure that, okay, I'm not just doing one robot for a specific person, but I'm actually doing three or four because I am bulking on the order to present this. And this is the type of, of uh, engagement that the marketplace is uh, offering and uh, benefiting all of those suppliers that would like to reach for a, a higher um, market uh, place. So basically what we have built is also a viable business model for the long-term sustainability of the SHAPES results. Um, we have defined eight business cases to understand exactly how the access to the shapes data, the information, and even the ecosystem of digital solutions would be available to the different users, the targeted audiences, not only older individuals, but also care professionals, also the health and care service providers. We have defined a specific governance model to allow us to more or less understand exactly how from an administrative point of view, we'll be able to implement this in the long term with a governance that will be able to sustain the values of shapes and to continue its work throughout the times. We have defined, of course, different exploitation avenues with business models that range from free access to specific users like researchers, uh, and older individuals to subscription modules uh, if there are specific elements of commercial value to be exploited. But most of all, we have set out a specific core of values and principles and a code of conduct to the SHAPES marketplace that will entail what we call the SHAPES seal of approval. This means that although we have built this trusted, open, fair and competitive place built on the activities that were done within shapes, we now have been able to translate this into new acquisitions that come into the marketplace. So the new digital solutions that are going to be filing a, a registration into the marketplace will also have to be built on the same principles that we have always applied during the shapes project, 
that we always try to apply with respect to the safeguard and the, the fundamental rights of the other individuals and to ensure that when the people are going to access the marketplace, they will continue to have innovative digital solutions to work with, to help them and to benefit them in the same terms that we had when co-developing all these solutions during the SHAPES project. So thank you so much for your attention. And I am now available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Barbara. And um, well, thank you for being available, but our our schedule um, <clears throat> really doesn't allow for many questions at this point, um, but we may have, uh, uh, well, we will have opportunity for some questions later, um, just so that we can uh, stay on schedule, uh, want to really move move on but thank you so much for uh, again demonstrating the huge amount of work and and thought and emphasizing the whole area of uh transparency and and trust and how we're trying to bring the the science of piloting um the technologies into the um into the marketplace and balancing the the idea of sort of supply uh, and and demand um so i think if we can move on to the uh next uh, presentation which uh, really continues with the theme of the marketplace and uh, Ionis uh, Kefalukas I hope that's pronounced almost correctly um, from Hellenic Mediterranean uh, University which I had the pleasure of visiting just a few weeks ago uh, is going to uh, give us a marketplace uh, a demo Thank you, thank you, Mac. Thank you, Barbara, for the presentation of the Shapes Marketplace. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Uh, okay, perfect. So, uh, hello. This is uh, Johannes Kavalikos, as Mac stated. Uh, Aris is associate from the Hellenic Mediterranean University. Um, I am a 29-year-old uh, white male that have black hair and uh, wearing a black shirt. I know I'm colorful. <laughs> Uh, today, I'm going to present to you the SAPES Marketplace. Uh, the SAPES Marketplace is a one-stop shop solution for healthcare uh, digital solutions and uh, data sets. Um, this presentation will take roughly 12 minutes, let's say, as we delve into the key features and the functionalities of the marketplace. Uh, our journey begins uh, at the terms and conditions page. Uh, I know it's not the most thrilling part, but uh, it's essential, it's crucial. Uh, to ensure security uh, and trustworthiness of uh, the marketplace. So uh, after that, we'll, be, we'll, we'll go to the top uh, corner of the, of the page, to the login page. Um, <clears throat> here we'll render our credentials. Uh, the credentials we have created from the SAPES ASAPA component. Uh, uh, the ASAPA component handles the vital task of authorizing and uh, authenticating um, our shapes ecosystem. So let's proceed. Uh, after after we have uh, logged in, um, we are at we are at the homepage, wherein we see the popular and latest products that have been successfully uploaded within the shapes ecosystem. Uh, also, I might add that uh, we have available uh, six different languages uh, for the shapes marketplace: English, French, German, Italian. Polish and Spanish, and also have some accessibility features that we can uh, check from the top, uh, sorry, from the bottom left corner uh, from the blue icon here. So uh, let's hastily proceed to the products page, uh, wherein we see all the available products, digital solutions, data sets that exist within the safe ecosystem. <clears throat> uh, if, if, we are a, we, if we are a user that has already created a SAPA component and have registered within the SAPS marketplace, uh, we can also proceed to add a product uh, of our own from the top right corner here in the, in the green button. Uh, let's see some product. Now, uh, a window pop up, pops up with all the vital information, the main, let's say, information for the product from uploading an image. Let's upload an image. Uh, the name. Marketplace demo product. 
it's priced, let's say 100 euros, and uh, uh, an optional discount, if there is any, uh, that is a percentage based. So uh, afterwards, we can select a category. Uh, it's either an open call solution or a safe digital solution data or other. I will go with other for now. Optional tags, uh, wh whatever you may want to be able to filter and set for your digital solution to be easily accessible and findable. Details, this is a marketplace demo product. And an optional description. Apart from that, we also have the options to either uh, request for our uh, product to be publicly available or keep it as hidden from the two options here. Whenever we request a, a, a product to be publicly available, uh, a, a, a safe admin, a safe marketplace admin, sorry, will have to verify that this digital solution is valid to be within the safe marketplace. Finally, we can also uh, utilize this field here, wherein we can provide the URLs for Google Play Store, Apple Play Store, or other downloadable URLs, for example, the digital solution site, uh, for the customers, for the end users to see and access. So I will request this uh, product to be publicly available, and I will submit my process. Now, uh, it's a successfully created product. I can filter from the blue button here in the top right corner to see the products that I have created. Uh, these products cannot be seen by other users since it's not verified yet by a safe marketplace admin. Uh, but going, going to the information here, I can see the full, full uh, functionality and customization that safe marketplace provides. So uh, if we click here the edit product uh, button that is disabled at the moment in the top right corner with blue, we go to the edit page. From here, we can edit images, upload new images or delete existing ones. We can provide a consent form. The consent form is uh, uh, a mandatory requirement for digital solution providers and uh, data set providers if there are ethics and privacy concerns uh, within the, the digital solution. So here, this is a demo consent form for our product. I'm going to save. I'm going to save this one as a as a mockup consent form for this product. We can alter uh, anything there is uh, about our um, product, and we also have some extra functionalities after we have published our product. For example, we can provide a video uh, for our product, sales product video that can showcase what our digital solution is, an introduction to our digital solution, and what the benefits of using our digital solution is. This is a mock-up video. Uh, following on, on, we can also provide custom documentations. The custom documentations have two options. We can either provide an already created PDF file, or we can add a custom documentation, which prompts us to uh, an editing, let's say, uh, page to write write out custom documentation using bolts and pretty much everything you will need to promote your digital solution. So we're going to add the custom documentation. Uh, I, I think the documentation failed. Um, yeah, we'll have, to, we'll have to verify the product first, but I'm going to showcase this just in case. Uh, so following one, we have the license. The licenses uh, are some keys that the digital solutions may require for uh, the end users to use the product. Uh, we have several, um, we have the, this method here to provide a, a license from the provider. Uh, it provides the endpoint, uh, so a URL for the endpoint that can extract the, the license and the API key to successfully be able to communicate with the provider. Uh, also, there is a help button here in blue uh, that, pro that creates a, a, a test example request method if you want to manually test it beforehand. Uh, I'm not going to add a license for, for, for this demo pur purpose. So uh, let me get to my other monitor to verify our product. I'm not going to show you the admin panel for to ensure the privacy of uh, our already existing users, and I'm sorry for that. So, 
let's uh, suppose that I, I'm going and I verify the product because it had to provide all the information that I wanted. So I um, validate the program, the product. Okay, perfect. Now I'm going to log out from this uh, user. I'm going to join as an end user that still hasn't provided this information within the state ecosystem. Now, uh, it's still the same, the same view as before, and we're going to product. We're going to search marketplace. Okay, marketplace demo product. And we're going to search for the product that we have already searched for. We see that the product is uh, now available since it has been validated. And we will go and see its information. Uh, everything here is available apart from the executable files that the digital solution provider could provide, uh, because that would be available, will, will, be, will be made available to the user after a successful purchase. So let's say that I'm interested in this uh, product and uh, I want it. I will going to add it in the card. Before I can add it to the card, I have to agree to the consent form that the digital solution provider made tailored to that product. Let's say that I agree. And uh, from the top right corner uh, in the blue button here, the cart, I can go to my cart page, where as I can see all the, pro the digital solutions uh, that I have in my cart, and I, will I can either clear or go proceed to the checkout page. Clicking thus to the checkout page, uh, I'm here notified that my profile basic information are missing. Uh, while I can see my checkout list, the price, the discount, and the product that I want, I cannot proceed to the checkout. So for that, uh, we're going here to the profile page that is marked with a, the, a big blue button here, go to profile, where we can see all the profiles, sorry, all the details uh, associated with, that, with our profile, from profile details, contact details, and billing details. Uh, optionally, we can also upload uh, an avatar for our profile. Uh, I'm not going to film this because I have already a uh, uh, verified uh, profile because after we have completed the filling, uh, after we have filled the information, uh, again, a safe, admin, a safe marketplace admin have to verify that we're a legitimate user and not a bot that tries to enter the marketplace. So I'm going to log out and join with this one. Now, with this one that we have been already verified, uh, marketplace, I can see our test product that's here. I will add it again in the cart, mm -hmm. agree to my consent form, go to the checkout page, proceed to the checkout. It verifies that our profile is good to go, and uh, we can proceed to the payment. So uh, the sales marketplace have uh, integrated the Stripe payment uh, module within to assess and verify security for our transactions. However, uh, until the project ends, we are still in test mode. Therefore, we're going to use a, a non-valid debit card to proceed with the payment. Uh, we can see here the test cards. So I'm going to click the pay, the pay button and I will be forwarded to the straight payment module. So here I'm going to... Uh, Place the card information. The year is irrelevant. 26, 999, 900 card. And I'm from Greece. Uh, I agree to pay. I will not save this card. And we see that the, our order has been successfully completed. Uh, afterwards, after five seconds, actually, we will be redirected back to the sales marketplace. Now, uh, after going to the, after we have purchased a, a, a product, we can search it again through the filtering process, and we have seen that we have successfully purchased this product. When we go within the information, we can see everything, but we have also another field, the purchasable files, that if the product had any purchasable files, let's like say an executable file, we can download it straight from the marketplace. Apart from that, uh, the Sips Marketplace provides and users that have bought a digital solution to add a product review. The product review is a, a two, a twofold, uh, has a twofold steps. Uh, one is a, a one to five star rating, 
and a comment that you can insert. So I'm going to give it five out of five because it was uh, an amazing product and this product helped me immensely. I'm going to submit. Uh, and we see now that uh, in live action that the, the, the average rating of the product has been altered to five out of five stars because it, it has uh, one purchase. And in the bottom here, we can see other users that have bought the product and used it, their comments. Uh, that will provide uh, a meaningful, uh, I think, uh, input to where us how and why the business solution helped them and how it can do the same to you. Before we conclude, uh, I want to express my sincere gratitude to each and every one of you for investing your valuable time and attention for our workshop here today. Uh, we encourage you to explore the SAPES marketplace further, whether you're a potential end user, a digital solution provider, or simply someone interested in the world of healthcare digital solutions. Uh, I think I'm not open to any questions because we are out of time, <laughs> but I'm, I will be here in the chat to answer anything that you may want. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ionis. That uh, was really uh, uh, detailed, and we were all um, taking screenshots when you were putting in your Visa card number. So uh, <laughs> perfect, perfect. But, um, just Feel free to use it in the safe market, please. <laughs> just to comment on on the uh, payment, because I know that will be of interest to people that we envisage it may be individuals uh, buying products on the marketplace sometimes it may be service providers and then providing individuals with a code um, where they can redeem the product um, it may be municipalities um, hospitals uh, etc et so the marketplace is set up to provide for a range of different ways of uh, of vending and paying for um, different technologies so um, just to be uh, respectful of time, um, we, we'll, we will move on. But thanks again for that uh, lovely demonstration. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And we will uh, we'll give you, um, I think, 10 minutes break. Um, but just to reassure you, we will be finishing at 13.30, um, 1.30 uh, Central European time, which is 12.30 um, Irish time. And um, if you can come back at seven minutes past 12, which will give you time for a coffee and to answer nature's call, hopefully. So see you in 10 minutes from now, seven minutes past 12. Thank you. Hi, Lucia. How are you doing? Good. Good, thanks. Yeah. Welcome. Um, so if we can have our other uh, panelists, which should be, there is Mark. Uh, welcome. Hi, Mark. Um, we have uh, Yoka. Is, is that the correct way to say yeah, your... Yoka? Is, I'm not a joke. I'm Yoka. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, Kathy is the other person we're looking for so just to remind um, our panel members and um, the uh, other participants that we've asked each panel member to give us sort of five minutes of uh, reflection um, and then we're all going to have a, a broader discussion and also use the uh, Slido uh, function. So I, I'm just looking to see whether Kathy is down as one of the participants at the moment. Do any of my colleagues know whether Kathy is with us? She is in the meeting, but we do not know if she's present. Okay, let's give her one more minute. Our other participants can rehearse what they're going to study. <laughs> um, and um, we might start um, with uh, Lucia, if that's okay. Um, 
who is are you speaking to us from Grand Canaria? Yes, correct. So she is definitely the most exotic uh, participant in terms of geography. <laughs> and she's speaking from the um, perspective of the World Federation um, of the, the Deaf Blind. So I think if, if you can give us your uh, initial sort of five minute um, impression and commentary, that would be great, Lucia. Sure. Um, thank you, Mac. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Lucia Darino. I represent the World Federation of the Deaf Blind. I'm a brunette Hispanic female in my early 30s, and I'm wearing a white blouse. Um, so when we talk about the question, what will a project like this be exploring in 10 years from now? Um, I have a couple of thoughts that I'd like to share with you. First of all, just uh, a quick background about WFDB. We are a, non, a global non-governmental organization. We have more than 75 members all around the globe. And the idea is to, or what we bring to the table is the perspective of persons with deaf blindness. In this case, uh, we have been a consortium member of the SHAPES project, and we have been able to provide feedback and insights on older people with deaf blindness and really make sure that the project is as inclusive and accessible as possible to people with deaf blindness. So when we talk about future projects, what will they look like? I think it's important to stress um, the role of technology and assistive devices. They're already important today, but I can imagine how important they will be in 10 years from now. And this will be a key element. It's already a key element for people with disabilities, but obviously it will be key for as well persons with deaf blindness. So when we talk about technology and assistive devices, it's also important that we take into account the digital inequalities and the gaps. So for instance, today in low income countries, over 90% of people do, with disabilities do not have access to assistive technology. So I think that's an important point that we all should uh, bear in mind. And when we talk about technology, we should make sure that the human rights are not compromised and that access to opportunities is a reality. Another important point is intersectionality. So intersectionality takes into account the multi-layered aspect of humans, and it takes into account the exposure to multiple discrimination, to the intersection of inequalities. So, so I think intersectionality is a key approach because communities are becoming increasingly diverse. They're becoming increasingly multi-layered. So I think it's important that projects in the future have cross-cutting cross components that relate to accessibility, that relate to inclusion, that relate to diversity. So I think it's important that we really bear this approach in mind, and that includes the perspective of underrepresented groups. So when we talk about projects, we really need to make sure that we're reaching those further behind in line with the Agenda 2030 by the UN. So really make sure that those that are usually less visible, like persons with deaf blindness, for example, are really their perspective is brought to the table. And of course, when we talk about intersectionality, yeah. for instance, yeah. if we think yeah. about an older black person with the blindness that belongs to the LGBTQ community, for example, um, we really make sure that, you know, we're really reaching out those groups that are usually underrepresented and that are often an afterthought. Another important point, I think it's civil society, self-advocates and representative organizations. We hope that they will become more empowered and stronger than ever. So, we really need to make sure that in future projects and any consultation or decision-making processes, we are including representative organizations, we're including activists, we're including people that speak for themselves and civil society. So in this case, I think partnerships are key. So we really should strive 
to make sure that we're engaging different groups in society. And we're making sure that we do not speak on behalf of any groups, but we really make sure that they, you know, have a, a representative role and they are empowered. And last but not least, I think it's important today, data collection, but I think in the future, data collection and more specifically, disaggregated data is key. So when we talk about disaggregated data, we are talking about data that has been filtered, that has been um, categorized by, for example, gender, disability, age. So here data in bulk is important, yes, but it's also important that it's disaggregated. So then we can include or, or we can analyze specific data that belong to specific groups. So for example, if we collect data on disability, but we're not disaggregating the data on disability, so what, can what type of disability? We know that sensory disabilities or physical disabilities, they, they have different requirements, they have different needs. So we would make sure that we're not leaving groups of persons with disabilities behind. And of course, funding is key for this. So when we talk, think about projects, we, we also should think about how funding is collecting data and doing it in the best way possible. So I would just like to encourage the audience to reflect on the importance of human rights, on inclusion and diversity. And these must be core values for future projects. And I think the SHAPES projects provides an excellent example of a good practice on how to include persons, organizations of persons with disabilities. And in our case, underrepresented groups like persons with deaf blindness that are often left behind. So back to you, Mac. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Lucia. And um, really great that you emphasized um, issues around intersectionality and uh, in inclusion, uh, the role of uh, civil society, and uh, the idea that the deaf blind community um, is really also an opportunity for improving accessibility of whether it's platforms or particular technologies that are, are technologies of the future for older people have to be designed for, for everybody. Um, and so the challenges around communication um, are a, a challenge for, for everybody. And, and a more, a truly open platform is one that's equally accessible to, to everyone. So thank you very much indeed. And uh, if we can go to Joka de Ruter Zvanikin, if that's correct. <laughs> what um, <a> name? <laughs> but, yes, uh, and, that's and, correct. Uh, that's we really correct. look forward to your uh, contribution with your overview from the, the uh, very expansive age platform, uh, Europe, Joka. So over to you, please. Thank you. It's, uh, I, I uh, rehearsed. Joke de Ruiter Zwaneken. <laughs> I'm board member of uh, Older Women's Network Europe, and uh, we are one of the organizations of uh, age platforms since many, many years. Uh, and saying uh, Older Women's Network means that I, I'm looking at life with, um, um, from a gender perspective, uh, if I look at life and politics. I had the honor to uh, and pleasure to uh, already participate in previous uh, Shapes Dialogue workshop, not, uh, namely the diversity and empowerment, understanding the realities of older people, which I shared is what does it mean getting older based on my own experience. Uh, this topic, over 10 years, a project, what will it uh, explore? Uh, I also therefore immediately started thinking about me in 10 years. I will be 90 then. And what do I think that society will look like? And how to be very old and face more vulnerable aspects? Uh, what would be of help? And how does society is looking then? Of and two uh, seniors. Clear is that getting older in 10 years, we all these have to start now to prepare. Um, and I hope that a research project in 10 years um, 
uh, some crucial principles uh, will, will count. And I already heard something about that and stressed that out like Lucia. It will reflect diversity of all the persons. Uh, the all over narrative is now that aging depicts all the people as inherently declining, passive, and vulnerable. Yet, uh, aging is a long, <laughs> a lifelong process involving both gains and losses during the combination of biological and psychological and social mechanisms. We are not vulnerable as individual, but face barriers that impact our well-being. Promote the rights of all the uh, people in research. All the people are not subjects of research. They are at best objects addressed as the elderly and called upon to val uh, validate things designed and developed by younger adults. We want to co-create, be involved in what pertains us and engaged and respected as every human being. Leave no behind, no one, and empower all the people, especially in long-term care by promoting our autonomy, our independence, our participation, and our inclusion. Improve the quality, especially for the lives of informal cares. Realize that informal care is the majority of caregiving for a long period in life by family, friends, and, and uh, others. And, um, and improve the quality and the working conditions for formal cares. Adopt in, in, uh, in the future uh, a life course perspective. Uh, embracing aging as part of a spectrum and acknowledgement that everybody ages and everyone ages on a different way. And last but not least, start directly in collecting data of people over 60 till 100 or more. Um, it's, it's Eurostat stops in most cases after 70. And I can tell you if there are no data, there's no policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, just that last uh, snippet, if there is no data, there is no policy. Um, very, very true. And I think in the sort of aging space, we, we are getting better at providing data, but the data is not yet being turned into exactly the sort of uh, policies that, that we need. Um, so I, I really like that you brought on the sort of gender perspective because that's such a key uh, area within uh, aging. And then also the, the idea of recognizing that whether it's within a gender perspective or not, there's a huge amount of, of diversity. Um, and there's also this challenge of changing the narrative around aging and uh, recognizing that there are significant gains uh, as well as as losses as well. So uh, I, th I think that that idea is is a really good one to progress on. And uh, Yoka has also given us um, an introduction to what I just want to um, explain before I go on and introduce Mark. Um, and that is that we're asking you with the Slido, just as uh, Yoka was mentioning there, to anticipate what projects like this should be doing um, in 10 years time. So we've given you two uh, series of suggestions um, and we're gonna go to the next two, but the access code is the same as, as you had before for the previous Slido uh, and you'll see it there in the chat again. Um, and so please uh, respond to us with ideas of what projects like this should be doing uh, in 10 years time. So I'm now going to go to uh, to uh, Mark and uh, Mark uh, Wheatley has been an important member um, of the Shapes Consortium and he's a very well networked person uh, within the 
uh, European uh, world of uh, civil society. And he's speaking on uh, behalf of the European Union of the Deaf. So over to you, Mark. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark, and I'm a middle-aged between uh, <laughs> around 50 aging and have a plaid shirt on. I am deaf and I'll be using sign language and you'll be hearing a female voice as the interpreter. All right. I completely support what Lucia's uh, has brought up in regards to diversity and inclusion are extremely important. It's actually one of the yeah, most important points I believe that we need to uh, focus on. And within the SHAPES project, I believe that it's been one of the very few projects out there that is disability led, that they are working within the project. I have seen so many European projects that have dispersed all of their information and then said, oh, wait a second, it's not accessible. It was an afterthought or they didn't even have the afterthought that they have produced so many different types of platforms, what have you, for the disabled community, for the deaf community, for the deaf blind community. But one of the strengths of the SHAPES program, that project, is that we've been involved from day one. Now, looking forward 10 years, we have to also really consider AI, artificial intelligence. We can't get around it. It is here to stay. And again, if we're looking even at sign languages and we're looking at different platforms, uh, we also need to think about how AI will have an, an impact. We have a sort Alexa, if you will, the uh, sign language. We have Alexa, which is how fortunately not accessible for the deaf, but in the future, uh, AI will be integrated and AI solutions with sign language will also be integrated in these platforms. So voice to sign solutions, we have some software where you can speak and there is be some basic sign language to where at one point it will be a possibility that they can then fully speak and it being translated into sign language using AI and they can speak to anyone. But when we look at the Convention for People of Disabilities, the CRPD, it, we need to make sure that it complies with the UNCRPD. So there can be many innovative platforms, but we also always need to keep the UNCRPD in mind and make sure that it is informed by the UNCRPD. We also have the European Disability Card. And this will also be a very important step for the disability community. It recognizes that the disabled world needs accessibility. I'll give you an example. Currently, disabled people, if you will, we are landlocked, if you will. And the reason why we're landlocked is because we are assessed within our own country, but that is only approved and avail and recognized in one country. We cannot bring this with us to another country. We need to be reassessed and be assessed in their own country under their own rules and be certified or go through whatever processes they have. And with the European Disability Card, we'll definitely enjoy that freedom to move like our non-disabled <laughs> um, fellow citizens have for many years. So this is something important to realize that there'll be more um, movement. Maybe now we need to look at ethics as well. There is a lot of data that we are collecting within the healthcare system. However, we need to make sure that we are very ethical, that it needs to be used ethically. So ethically used data, that we need to be very aware on what that entails. And I also believe that in the future, we need to really 
make sure that we work together with the tech world. I believe if we partner with the tech communities more often uh, that we can forward better. Again, there are many innovations out there, huge companies that are inventing many different types of technology, but many of it is not accessible. Again, it's either an afterthought and that becomes way more expensive to do the adaptations. It's best if we partner with them from the very beginning, but we need to realize that we need to go to them as well, that they think of accessibility and the disability community from the start. We also need to realize that there are many stakeholders uh, that are involved, but we need a diverse amount of stakeholders, not keeping within our own bubbles. If we truly work together, with so many stakeholders, then we can have a, also a truly intergenerational approach. And that's when we can take stock and use all of our strengths. We can communicate. We need to communicate with both the older generations and the younger generations. Uh, and this will happen through technology and technology can support that intergenerational approach and communication. You know, our mental well being is also something that we need to really consider. It is so easy for someone to be isolated. So it is really important that we have full access to, for us, it's sign language so that we are not isolated. So, with all these points in mind, uh, these are just a few. There is a lot more I could share, but uh, due to the limit of time, I will keep it to this. But I just want to leave you with that we need to remember that the disability community also needs to lead this fight when we need to work together with the tech community and we need to teach them how to incorporate and involve the deaf community and any disabled communities and all communities. We can make sure that the technical solutions are actually viable for all the communities that they're trying to involve. Again, Many technical solutions are not available, not accessible to deaf blind or to the deaf, even though they say that it's inclusive. So when we look at the word inclusive, let's all just please keep our eyes on what inclusive means because until now inclusive is a very narrow definition and it's not including deaf and deaf blind people. So I believe in 10 years time, there'll be a great shift to true inclusion and inclusive data and that the deaf and deafblind people will be on the map, but we need to make sure that they are, because that won't happen uh, by itself. And that way, if we look at the most excluded, we can include everyone. And then we will truly leave no one behind. And like they say, nothing about us without us. We're here, please make use of us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you uh, so, so much, uh, Mark. And um, in fact, I really like to make that link between social inclusion and, and mental health. Um, as you were mentioning before, that uh, these are two intimately related processes and exclusion has, has mental and physical uh, consequences along with the, the sort of social uh, consequences. Um, I also love that you sort of grounded this in a rights-based uh, approach in terms of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. And while the convention has had a significant impact in the disability community, um, it is only starting to have the impact that it should have uh, within the uh, aging community across Europe um, as well. And uh, this has stimulated a, a range of, of new legislation coming uh, in across Europe. And the best lever for making that legislation work is the compliance with the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disability. Um, you mentioned um, AI in terms of being a significant uh, player in, in the future. And I'm sure that is an issue that we will uh, talk a little bit more about now. Um, and I'm going to uh, go over now to uh, my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Kathy, who um, 
the Kathy's brief was to be very critical of us, but to be very nice as well. And uh, she's one of the best people at combining these uh, two two attributes. Um, Kathy um, is a professor at University College London and the academic lead of the Global Disability Innovation Hub. And indeed, she's she's led a, a very large uh, project, 80 20 30, that looks at uh, digital and assistive technology provision um, worldwide, but particularly uh, within Africa and uh, within Asia as well. So um, thanks for joining us, uh, Kathy. We like you. You have a very big house behind you. We're very impressed. Yes. Um, it, it masks my base more flat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In London. <laughs> yeah, well, this is welcome. GCL. Yeah. No. Thank you. And uh, as Max says, uh, he is a friend, uh, but I, I, I can still be critical of friends, as he knows <laughs> we've had many debates over the years. So um, thank you, first of all, and just congratulations to everybody. I, I don't say that lightly. I know how difficult it is to run a big interdisciplinary across different countries program, especially during a pandemic. And um, as was mentioned, I think right at the very start, I won't remember everybody's names, but right at the very start when we were talking about the work package on the ethnography that led to the shape stories, you know, that had some benefits. We, we were sometimes the world got unlocked for us. And, and actually, I think it's really reflective of something that, um, that before the pandemic, many people would have been told you can't do things online. You, know, you must come into the office. And many disabled people or many older people with mobility uh, problems or maybe who struggle to hear in open plan uh, environments, they might not uh, say that they were deaf but they were unable to do their work in, in such a noisy environment, they, they would have been excluded from the workforce or, or made to feel ashamed or stupid or, or some other negative emotion. And, and now it's more normalized and, and that can continue or, or it can contract again as, as new norms um, begin to, to settle. And so I, I really do think one of the things that stood out for me in, in, in your project was the, the interdisciplinarity that actually worked, <laughs> so, um, which is hard. It's hard to get things like a marketplace. It's very easy to be critical of a marketplace. You put up a marketplace. It's very easy to have some you know, design considerations about how maybe maybe some of it, it could be better. But it's also very difficult to do full user centered design uh, within that. And I think one of the things that came out through the shapes through today's uh, talks was the number of complex theories that we used to try and understand this problem. So whether it be the human activity uh, centered approach or the cultural historical activity system, it's trying to take that systems view that I know, Mac, you you um, really do believe in. And, and I think you're um, a great protagonist of it. Like you're, you're able to actually apply some of that thinking into the real world, because I, I'm not sure who said it, but somebody said today that the solutions are often simple um, and the problems are often complex. So oftentimes we have problems with the, the likes of inclusion that Mark just mentioned, where people might believe a solution to be inclusive, and yet it excludes a, a huge section or even a small section of society, but an important section of society. In the same way, as people get older, they may or may like to take on the mantle of being disabled. They may hate that label, or they may think actually that is who I am. I'm actually, I've always been a disabled person. I'm an older disabled person or actually something happens where I begin to feel I am disabled and, and other people will never want to be called that. And so these labels can sometimes make us fight amongst ourselves, which I think is, is a, a problem <laughs> when actually we need to, to come together more. Um, one of the, the, the challenges I think when a project like this ends is that it ends. Um, and I would think I'd love to hear how, how it can continue, how elements of it can continue, how things like the marketplace can, can, can continue, how it can maybe join forces with other marketplaces that are arriving uh, around the globe, things like the ethnographic stories, how we keep those going, because in 10 years time, those stories will be very different because the technology um, will be very different. Um, I'll just pick up on one other thing, which is around this idea of digital and, and even how we measure that, like the model of assessment of telemedicine applications. What will the future of telemedicine applications be in, in, in 10 years time? And something I've been thinking about a lot recently is the technology amplification theory, which basically states that technology is agnostic, uh, but it will, when the technology is introduced, it can exasperate inequalities. So we see that um, 
for example, it starts the pandemic with people who didn't have access to internet, who maybe weren't trained on digital devices, um, or when digital devices were inaccessible to them. But we also see it globally with people not getting access to the assistive technology they need. And then new, new technologies come along, AI-powered technologies. But for an AI-powered technology, you need basic digital infrastructure. Uh, you need the access to that digital infrastructure. You need some basic training in, in understanding how these applications are working. And, you know, one of the questions or comments that came up earlier was about this, um, this tension between security and usability. Right? So that's going to get more complicated, I, I think, as, as time uh, progresses. Um, and so one, I'll just finish with the, the other maybe elephant in the room, which is the big geopolitical context of life. Right? We don't know where we will be in 10 years time. Um, but if technology can amplify division, which it's been shown to do, but it can also bring us together, I would love us to begin to think of technologies that are more convivial. How do we create technologies that are all about bringing communities together, overcoming the divides in, in the data that Lucia mentioned that we should be looking at? So if we're getting this dis disaggregated data, that's great. But really what we care about is all those disaggregations coming together <laughs> and being a society, being a community. And that's where I think we need to be looking as we as we go into the next version of whatever Horizon 2020 brings or whatever the next funding solutions bring. How do we make sure that Europe is at the, and I'll try if I'm allowed to still include the UK in that geography of Europe, but how do we make sure that we are part of that global world and, and bringing the globe closer together, as well as the inequalities we might face across age or across gender or across race um, and across disability. But um, with that, Mac, uh, hopefully those were sufficient critical uh, reflections. I just yeah. really will say thank you. I really think it was great. I've really enjoyed myself the last uh, few hours. Um, it's been great to hear all the great work that your team and the teams uh, across Europe have been doing. And, and so well done, one and all. And well done, Horizon well, 2020, for funding us. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Cathy. And um, yeah, I mean, you really draw up the idea of technology for social cohesion. And um, if it's almost, I, I guess, if you're saying if if we don't find ways of developing that, then we're going to be, you know, very challenged in in other ways. Um, and I, I love the idea of actually COVID sort of unlocking our potential um, with uh, digital and assistive technologies. And certainly, yeah, as you know, within the Irish context, we we found that we were able to accelerate things during COVID uh, in terms of uh, remote. Uh, provision of services that would have maybe taken us a decade to do uh, without COVID. Um, now, as you say, it's not it's not one or the other. It's it's bringing face to face interaction and um, together with techn technologies and having uh, blended uh, services and blended sorts of interaction. Um, I'm really glad that the the systems approach that we've taken and the sort of interdisciplinarity. Um, has has come through um uh, often it can be really challenging to take in so many different perspectives but our experience has been that it's even more challenging to leave out different perspectives because ultimately in the implementation um that's when things become undone um, and whether that's from civil society and academia and uh, industry and providers and um as uh, yoka was mentioning earlier the importance of uh, informal uh, providers who uh, as she said provide actually the majority uh, of care for people so um thank you very much for those comments and um I, I i want then to give the panel a brief break but we will come back to you so don't relax too much um and I want to go over to uh, Stacey and um, maybe Stacey, can you tell us where we're at um, with the question, what will a project like this be exploring in 10 years from now? Yeah, um, so it's Stacey speaking um, again. And so I'd like to just thank the panel very much for your very interesting inputs on the presentations from today and obviously all the presenters um, that spoke today. So we've had some good interaction with our Slido on the question, what will a project like this be exploring in 10 years from now? Um, so I'm just going to read through some of our answers. 
we've had comments on accessibility and um, autonomy from support and older people. We'll be exploring assistant living technologies and processes. The differences will be in the power of the technologies being explored. Similarities hopefully still be the same focus on elevating the voices of older people and the voices of those who are directly impacted by the current processes empowerment of civil society, maybe looking at that intersectionality with older groups, women, etc. Um, protecting older adults, once again, intersectionality with environmental dangers, disasters, climate change, technologies as seamless support and not being pushed towards older people. Um, we'll be evaluating the impact that robots, smart homes and other technologies have on the care of older adults living in their homes until the end of their lives. So supporting that community living. Um, tap the potential of technology to increase personalization of support services, taking into account individuals' preferences and an intersectional approach, ensure control and accountability complaint mechanisms, find ways to train artificial intelligence so that it upholds human rights principles overcoming the barrier that the data will feed it. It is likely reproducing widespread stigma and di discrimination. Regulate to avoid that technology is considered a solution to the expense of human relationships, human support and care, and coordinate with social protection schemes and systems to facilitate equal access to the growing range of innovation. Um, Shapes will continue to explore its informational resources and piloting approach to ensure that the access to high quality accessibility and affordable is scalable across Europe and the marketplace will continue to provide trusted products and services for the silver economy that fully respecting the rights of the older people continue to support a smart and healthy aging. Um, then we have collecting data, monitoring tech and social innovation and best practices. Tech is evolving at ex exponential rate, level of built and social infrastructure to promote best practices, evolve standards and policies, ensure solutions, support sustainability, scalability, adaptability, inclusivity, cross-section person-centered needs. And then we go back to sustainability and continuity through the shapes network, artificial intelligence and um, integrated policy frameworks. So there is a silo for policy on aging and disability. Policy should aim to be more inclusive by integrating perspectives on aging and disability to form a more holistic approach and then solid feedback mechanisms in projects. So that's where we stand so far. I can cross check the chat to see if we have any more comments in there. Doesn't appear so at the moment. Okay, that, that's great. Uh, thank you, Stacey. Um, so there's, there's, there's loads of uh, issues being raised and good questions coming in. And these are all going to be uh, collected um, within the report that's coming out of uh, this webinar. And that will be amid available to everyone uh, who's attending the webinar and indeed uh, beyond that. So please keep your um, points coming in and, and your various, uh, doesn't need to be a question, it can be a statement. Um, and we will uh, look forward to sort of sharing this with other stakeholders. Um, last week, we had a very good um, meeting in the European uh, Parliament um, where you heard earlier about the smart mirror in um, uh, Sonia's presentation uh, about the different pilots. Um, so this was developed in uh, Spain and we uh, were actually able to de demonstrate it for some of the MEPs um, last week. And there's been a lot of interest um, in uh, developing this work further. We are also developing a a policy statement, um, as again, uh, Yoko was uh, mentioning uh, this, as was was Mark uh, earlier, about the importance of linking up um, data and policy. So we're developing a, a 
policy statement, which is also going to be circulated around the members of the European Parliament. Um, and that will be done in terms of a manifesto, which we hope that they will sort of sign up to as well. And in a few weeks, we'll be presenting at a, a WHO event um, uh, about um, how to design ageing in Europe in the uh, years ahead. So all of your ideas, we're going to try and feed into these different sort of um, forums and uh, opportunities. Um, and just as I'm talking, I'm reading some of the um, comments, um, both in the, the Q&A and the chat and the Slido. And one theme I want to pick up on, it's a, it's a, it's a comment earlier in the chat about the, the chat GBT, uh, in fact. And um, I'd really like to come to, to Kathy on, on this uh, first, but one of the, uh, I guess, things that many people um, in the sort of older community find both intriguing, but also a bit scary, uh, is the idea of, of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, et cetera, and of, of this challenge of embracing it for, for a rights-based uh, approach. I know that you've done uh, work with the UNESCO uh, Center um, that that's developing this, and you're you're doing some work around that yourselves in in UCL. So, can you give us a sort of read of? Um, well, I know it's hard to say where machine learning will be next year, but maybe it's easier to say where it will be in ten years. And what should we be hoping for and fearing? You're on mute at the moment. Easy one, Mac. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so the person who can't find the unmute button. Um, so I think it's important to realize that uh, artificial intelligence, as we call it, isn't actually that intelligent. Perhaps it's, you know, mostly it's just predicting the next word or the next phrase or, or beginning to predict that phrase in context with other phrases or similar within, within a pattern recognition or image recognition. So the important thing with any sort of machine learning application is that it has to learn. So we have to give it data to learn. So if that data has biases in it, then it's going to learn those biases. It, it can't. It can't do anything else. This is. It's. We're feeding it biased information. So that's the the first thing I suppose that we have to be wary of. Is um, you know, we were in Ghana uh, a month, last month. I was in Ghana trialing or trying to understand how a new application called the Google Relate project, which is freely available on Android, launched by Google. It's a great project. And this is not a project funded by Google. This was us just wanting to know how the Google project worked. Um, and it's been rolled out in Ghana. And so what it does is it takes um, dysartic speech or slurred or difficult to understand speech in English, and it translates it into text um, and it will just work. And, and so it can create uh, this freely available um, augmented or alternative communication system. But we realized that nobody seemed to be using it. <laughs> so like, could it could it work in Ghana? Could it work with Ghanaian voices? Did anybody even know about it? Does that make sense? So I think this is the other problem is that when we arrived, there were only about 10 speech and language therapists in Ghana and we managed to train all 10 of them to, to, to know about um, the Google Relate project in just a couple of weeks. But it, we're gonna have this wave of technologies that come that are created or in inverted commas, people with different impairment groups, whether they be older people or disabled people. Um, and it might be the case that the population doesn't even know it exists. Um, and if they do know it exists, they might not even, they won't know how to use it. And if they do know how to use it, they might be scared to use it because they don't know where this data is going. They don't know how it's interpreting them. Um, and then finally, it might be that all of these solutions are based on something like English, um, based on maybe very North American and European centric language models and phrases and cultural expressions. And therefore, in a way, those cultural expressions will be infiltrating, you know, other cultures. And, and you could only use these augmented communication devices if you want to speak like us, not if you want to speak Ghanaian English, for example, which you should be able to speak, right? You, you, we sh nobody should be imposing a language or a culture on, on another on another um, another population or another culture. So I think where we're going is, like Mark said, we are going to get to the stage. Apple apparently are working on some very good AI models that are going to automatically generate lots of things for us. So we're going to go from images. So we will eventually get past all of the one-handed uh, sign language interpretation models 
because the, the amount of data we, that we will have will feed the ability to understand complex uh, sign language and maybe do sign language to sign language interpretation. It's always interesting when you need in you know British, Indian, and international <laughs> at different you know the different languages. So, but they, you have it into into language, uh, and also for people that don't use words particularly well, we should be able to create images or or, or videos. Um, and I, I think that will all happen. I, I think it's going to have profound changes on, on how we think, uh, uh, on how we educate, if I'm really honest. Like, we, we will no longer, I was talking to some, a friend of mine at Microsoft the other day, and, you know, in computer science, one of the classic modules that you learn is computer science 101, how to code. You don't, you don't have to learn how to code anymore, not really. You just ask ChatGPT to write you a Python script, you know, in different language, a script in this particular language, and it will write it for you to do whatever you want. What we really need to do is be teaching people how to use these technologies, what what use can be made of them and, and, and where the pitfalls of them are when when they make mistakes, when the, the problems that are easy for them to solve and the problems that are very difficult for them to solve and when those problems will be um, particularly difficult. I could keep going, Mac, but I feel like I should put a natural pause in there <laughs> just to check that um, give yeah. others a chance to talk about other sure. things. Sure. Well, that, yeah. Th thank, thank you very much. And um, I mean, just what you've been saying, um, uh, people may not be aware on the call. There was a book written a couple of years ago by Azim Azur called Exponential. Uh, and the underlying message of that, and I, I maybe ask Mark if he could comment on this, but the underlying message of it, uh, as Kathy was saying, that the rate of technological development is exponential but in fact the the governance around it um is not developing at anything like the same rate um and mark you were suggesting that one of the uh, key challenges was that in future technology development that we would have the the lived experience of people with a range of different disabilities working with industry um, we have some projects like SHIPS that do have a, a lead and very participative role for people uh, with a range of different, different disabilities, but most projects don't, and most technology developed by industry uh, doesn't. So how can we change the, the, the governance and the expectation, and as um, Cathy was saying, that the narrative around how we should develop technology and how it should the development should be more participative. I know that was a long question, Mark. <laughs> but if you could maybe give us your your views on how we can encourage People with disabilities. Yes, 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 yeah. Indeed, I was just looking back at the question. Okay. I think where we can start with is people say that we need to get on the train before it leaves the station. And so they all say, we, if we're not, if we don't get on the train, you know, the train will leave without us. However, I think we need to add to that. Maybe we don't need to get onto the train, but we actually need to change the strategy or change the route of where the train is going. We decide where the train goes. So we don't even necessarily, so that's step beforehand. I think that's a part that we're missing. If we want to be there, we need to decide where the train goes no matter how fast it goes or how slow it goes, if we're on it or not, uh, as, uh, as we won't be left behind if we are the one in charge of the direction. I think that's a really important part that we need to remember, that we are the ones in charge, then it'll work. And because what we want, what we, what we want to have is not difficult to imagine. But I think that's something for us to think about, <laughs> that we decide where the train goes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think that's a lovely uh, metaphor. Um, 
and the we maybe maybe need a train that isn't restricted to certain tracks. <laughs> that um, and and maybe the uh, the world of technology is a bit scary, where the train maybe goes, <laughs> you know, back and forth. Um, but this idea of it being guided through participation, through people deciding um, th themselves, we need a, a a broader sort of governance structure that that ensures that is the case, and where it's it's technology for people rather than technology for technology, um, and maybe just building on that. Uh, and thank you, Mark. And uh, Yoka, if we could come back to you, you talked about the gains and the losses um, in terms of aging. Um, and you were thinking of this in terms of in 10 years time. Um, could you, w whether it's for yourself or for, you know, the broader sort of aging community, which is, of course, hugely diverse, um, Talk to us about some of the the gains uh, as one gets older, because I think that's a a narrative that isn't developed enough. And and if maybe technology helps with some of those gains, or maybe it's not necessary. Well, first uh, the technology. Um, a little bit earlier on the silver economy, I was at uh, in Brussels when the silver economy project uh, starts, and uh, I remembered uh, a gentleman from Vodafone, and he said, "There's no market for it." <laughs> and, uh, that's about ten years ago, <laughs> and um, well, COVID uh, learns us that there was a huge market for it, and that a lot of people who could stepped in and tried their, their um, um, uh, the, the tablets to yes. be in contact if you can't. So it, it was a help. It was a help that you could work from, from home and not have to travel. And it's something that we gained at that moment, uh, not only for the young ones, but also for the, for the older ones. And, uh, so we gain, yeah, philosophically about getting old, you gain perhaps a, a bit more patience. Personally, I, I gain a bit more patience because I can't walk that, that quick and it makes me more reflective. But uh, what you lose, what you lose, what we are losing sometimes is the connection with society. Mm. Um, uh, and if, if, uh, losing people around you. There's a, a lot of loss and there's a lot of, it's hard work to, to um, accept that and uh, make it part of, well, that's, that's my life now, but there's so, so much still left to do uh, that uh, always look at the bright side. Mm -hmm. um, you see, um, I was thinking about what Mark was saying and uh, Katie, that uh, you both have the, the, the privilege of having a United Nations um, guidance for yes. people with disabilities. Uh, we, we as old ones <laughs> are struggling to get have the same. We have the strange effect that uh, I'm, I'm a, a informal care for my sister-in-law. She is deaf blind. Uh, she is 63. When she is 65 now in the Netherlands, 66, 67, it never <laughs> will, will go away, but then she is old. And then she doesn't have the, 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 the protection from what she has now. You mm. lose it in a way. It's, it's a very strange yes. uh, effect. And uh, that I think in, when we speak in age, you, you, you hear that in different uh, 
um, different countries. There are things for unless you are uh, younger and then, but you stay the way you are. You can't walk, you can't see, you have, you, you need certain things, but then you're old and it's, it's, there is a, we have to do something about that. So we are really struggle to have our, our own formal rights like people with uh, disability. Mm. Okay, well, well thank, thank you. And um, one of the, um, I have a neighbor here who has uh, two children who live in Australia. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, there's a long history of Irish people migrating to Australia. And, and I Australia. know. Yeah. And um, so she is a, a grandmother many times over. And she was saying to me just the other day how um, she felt that one of the big gains for, for her was one, having more time for her children, uh, her grandchildren, and two, being able to know her grandchildren in Australia almost better than she knows her grandchildren in Ireland because she spends a lot of time on online. And, um, you know, I think that's one example of how technology can mediate cer yes, certain that, things. That's, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Although uh, Australia is fine because my dearest oldest sister was living in Australia. <laughs> and uh, I know that uh, my, uh, my cousin there sometimes is reading for their, her grandchildren living in Victoria and they living in Queensland. They were reading, she was reading the books <laughs> by video for her grandchildren because it's a four and a half hour flight to go there. So yes, we had, there's a lot of things to celebrate in uh, uh, with with um, this, but also you have to see that uh, sometimes the ability is um, decreasing of using it. I fear for the time that I need <laughs> another telephone because the display is a bit different, and I really have to to fight to handle it like I do with the old one but sure. it's that's with so that's um and whenever you have a small uh, uh brain accident all of a sudden things are gone and and so uh, a lot of 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 uh, what you what you gained and what you studied before is sometimes out of out of out of your hand out of, that's <laughs> actually I see you do this. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I think it it's it's very important that you convey uh, as as you do very clearly, you know, the, the real challenges that there certainly are gains, but there are a range of losses that some yes. can not can undermine uh some of the technologies that, that we hope will assist people. So, you know, cognitive abilities can both be strengthened through technologies, but if you have a stroke, for instance, then other modalities need to be uh, developed. Um, and I think that relates to some of what um, uh, Mark and Lucia was saying in terms of um, not having just one mode of access to, to different technologies, but whether it's motor skills or whether it's... Um, mm -hmm deafness or blindness people need a, a range of ways to be able to connect otherwise they become very uh, very isolated yes and, and let us uh, think uh, Mac, that in the end of the day that uh, it's it's not a computer it's it's not all the all the different equipment it's a, a human hand yeah, yeah, yeah. and and uh, <laughs> That's that's. Um, uh, I don't think I look at my tablets when my, my time is called, but I love to have my people around and hold their hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Um, thank you. So, Lucia, if we can come back to you, and um, you mentioned the word which I love, but it's sometimes very difficult to make it concrete, and that's sort of intersectionality. Um, so in 10 years time, will we be any further forward regarding intersectionality? 
or will our attempt to be more diverse just make intersectionality more of a difficult task? I think so. We're already seeing how an intersectional approach is being um, embraced in projects, in strategic frameworks, in core values of organizations. I do think so. Like we're understanding that humans are multi-layered, they're complex, they have different labels that they identify themselves with, and we're understanding now that the intersection all of all of those identities have results and have consequences. And when humans are exposed to structures of discrimination, um, then we're understanding that the reality and their experience differs. So I think ignoring that this is a reality and ignoring that persons with or people in general are exposed to different structures of inequalities and their identities kind of create a result in their interaction with the rest of the world. If we ignore this, then we're just leaving people behind. Mm. And I think luckily we're walking away from the norm, which traditional has been white, heterosexual, non-disabled, et cetera. Like when we're walking away from that and understanding that that is no longer good enough, right? Like that is not representative of the world that is becoming increasingly diverse. Um, so I, I am optimistic with the future. I'm already seeing organizations and people and different uh, governments uh, kind of embracing this, this approach. So I, I do, I think that if we refuse to do this, we're just gonna be leaving people behind. Indeed, thank you very much. Um, and just before we go back to Slido, I wanted to um, ask Kathy about um, moving technologies through technical readiness levels. Um, yeah. and does she have advice going from prototypes to what people can actually access in their sitting room, as it were? Thanks, Mac. Um, and as you know, it's a topic dear to my heart. We we sometimes call it the TR level five challenge, which is at the end of these kind of projects, we get to what I would argue is a very good proof of concept, which um, probably demonstrates a, a product user fit. So it's a if it's been well developed with users within systems, you know, it's got a product that that is useful and usable by people, and potentially has gone a little bit further to look at how it would come to market. But then to get that product to market is really hard. Um, and we just recently did a review with um, the International Society of Prosthetics and Orthotics on, on digital manufacturing systems for prosthetics and orthotics. And the drop off for TRL level evidence is just massive. There's loads of innovation in, in these like early stages, and, but then nothing seems to get to people. And this is where in the disability world, we come up with this, the idea of a disability dongle, a thing that's maybe either useless to us because it, it it's either not solving the problem we want or, it's highly aspirational, but never comes to market. So it gets everyone very excited, <laughs> but, but you can never use it. So I think it's incumbent. It's, it's not actually on us. I think if I'm really honest, I think it's in funding mechanisms, it, assistive technologies, technologies that, that are in more niche areas, they require more support than the average uh, health tech, the average uh, FinTech. And so we do need some funding mechanisms that better connect the dots from, from research to innovation. So. I think if we can collectively pull some thinking around it and just highlight the, that problem space, because every entrepreneur I've ever spoken to, or every academic I've ever spoken to, the reason it doesn't come to market is not because of a lack of desire. It's just there's a lack of capacity and funding, a lack of resources um, to, to do so. Okay, so that's um, a, a great place to, um, I guess, conclude our panel discussion because it really relates back into what the user needs and what the system is not yet providing. And I, in a sense, I have a fear we might be here in 10 years time saying the system's still not providing this, but hopefully um, the reports and the work coming from the SHAPES project can contribute to um, at least nudging us forward more effectively in that uh, situation. Before we conclude, I'd just like to go back to you, Stacey. Um, and I'd like to thank all our panelists for their um, open and uh, engaging uh, contributions. Thank you for being honest and challenging uh, with us as well. 
Stacey, where are we? Um, have we got any Nobel Prize winning ideas from the Slido? Um, who knows? Um, it's up to <laughs> yeah. the academics, I think, to make that happen. Um, <laughs> but we've had some great interaction. There's nothing new as of yet. Um, but I will be leaving the Slido open for an hour after this closes. So that will be 2.30 Central European time or 1.30 Irish time. Um, so people feel free to continue to contribute your engagement, your thoughts and your comments. Um, you can also email the shapes.info at mu.ie email um, with any additional comments that you'd like added to the report or for us to consider moving forward. Um, I'd also like to reiterate Max thanks not only to the panelists, um, your contribution has been massively appreciated and engagement. The attendees also, for everyone who's attended, um, also your engagement and discussion has been fascinating and we are delighted to have it. Um, Mac, for stepping in and moderating so thoughtfully. We're always desperately appreciative of our marvellous PI and coordinator. Um, and also, I'd like to take a special moment of thanks for our interpreters who have done a marvellous job making this dialogue workshop accessible um, as best we can. And I think we would be absolutely failing if we did not also acknowledge the exceptional technical um, assistance that have been provided by Age Platform, particularly Vera Hurman, our Work Package 10 lead. So I'll hand it back to you, Mac. Okay, well, well, thank you. And um, yeah, thanks for expressing our appreciation to uh, everyone. We have said that our uh, project is uh, coming to the end at the end of uh, this uh, year. We have um, some uh, events with uh, WHO in terms of the European uh, office to try and get as much impact for our work as, as uh, we possibly can. Um, and uh, we then have a further workshop, uh, which is more of an internal workshop in, in Crete. And then our very final um, public event um, will be uh, hosted by the Agile Aging Alliance uh, in uh, London, right at the beginning um, of uh, November. And that will be compared by the incomparable uh, in uh, Spiro. Um, and we will be highlighting there eight uh, new technologies that come from um, uh, an open call, which we have uh, funded. And these are technologies uh, which have been commissioned to address particular uh, problems that really promote uh, social inclusion uh, in, in a meaningful way. Um, so we... We really look forward to, to that. It's a sort of a dragon's den, but they've already got the funding. So um, we hope to take the competitive element out of it and to have it more of a sort of celebratory um, event. So thank you all very much uh, for, for joining us. Um, and uh, we, uh, we look forward to developing a, a report uh, on this uh, webinar and to uh, sharing it with you all. Um, so I wish you good afternoon uh, where, wherever you are um, and enjoy the rest of your, your day. Thank you very much on behalf of uh, the SHIPS uh, Consortium and particularly on behalf of Maynooth uh, University uh, in, in Ireland. Thank you. Bye.